Okay, Raw. Number 232, November 3rd, 1997. The Go Home Show for Montreal. Sure was. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. A Go Home Show in which the world champion did not even appear. So, well, yes. you know, he was home resting. He was home resting, we were told. That's what they said. With the rest of them? I guess. That's not fair. No. <laughs> it's blatant bullshit that Shawn but, Michaels uh, was here and he was at home. Shawn Michaels here wrestling Ken Shamrock uh, and Brett's at home chilling out. So does that mean Brett's match against Shamrock was his last appearance for 15 years, whatever it was? Yeah. yeah. Well, pay-per-view, but on Raw. On Raw. Appearance on Raw. Okay. Uh, Steve Austin came out to get a promo. Talking about his upcoming Intercontinental title match against Owen Hart. Vince says, Austin, you have ticked off the hearts. You have ticked off the Nation of Domination. And you've ticked off Ahmed Johnson. Austin corrected him, said they have pissed I have pissed all of them off, and they've pissed me off. Uh I didn't like Owen. Didn't really have a problem with the nation or Ahmed. They happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. That's the key. He succinctly explained the Stone Cold Steve Austin character. It is not complex. He says, I don't have a problem with any of these baby faces. Essentially, he's not going to seek them out to cause trouble. But if he's in the ring and you're in the ring, you're fair game, no matter who you are. Right. Are you going to drink that whole thing during the show? No, I got a smoothie. Did I do that in the mic? <laughs> yeah. I apologize. That's fine. I will not do it again. Let's see. Uh, Ahmed came out in a velvet sweatshirt. <laughs> Tucked into very tight, almost white jeans with a big, huge fanny pack and cowboy boots. Mm -hmm. Get your burials out of the way now, because... I don't know, this isn't even a burial. I'm going to put this guy over. I'm just amazed. <laughs> so he comes out, says he used to respect Austin, but then Austin had crossed his end zone, and now he's going to kick Austin's ass. He starts to go into this speech about how he's been on his own since age 13. He challenged Austin to a match tonight. The key to all this is... There's two very angry men who want to fight each other, and they're in the same ring having a chat, and there's like a dozen geeks between them to make sure the fight doesn't break out. As opposed to 2016, where these guys who hate each other get in the ring all alone, and they just talk. This was better! So Austin, of course, accepted the challenge. I understood 70% of Ahmed's promo, which is a vast improvement. Maybe a record. Yeah. Yeah. And I thought this was the first great promo of Ahmed Johnson's entire career. And it was the first time ever that I looked at the guy and I listened to him. And I thought, this dude could draw money. Mm. He retires shortly thereafter, <laughs> if I recall correctly. He leaves his company. But yeah, this was the first time ever that I actually I saw what they saw in Ahmed Johnson. They plugged a gold dust, gold dust promo. Promising that Goldust had, and I quote, quote, this is their words, not mine, their words, raped his wife of her dignity. Now, that's disgusting on its own. But also, they clearly don't know how to use some of these words. You cannot rape somebody of something. I believe Vince used the exact same phrase in the Andre the Giant haircut angle. I believe he said they are raping him of his dignity. No, it doesn't work that way. That's not what it means. That's not how it's used. Maybe he meant he, they reaped him of his dignity. Like I, he's a reaper. Perhaps I just misunderstood. I don't think so. I don't either. No, they said it many times. There was over, no misunderstanding. Over and over. Here's the thing. We'll talk about the angle here in a little while, but when it's over, they go back to good old JR who's outraged. He's furious. Mm -hmm. They're all furious. So why'd they air it? <laughs> I don't know. And not only did they air it, they were so appalled that they made sure to plug it and advertise it in advance. This reaping coming up later here on this program. I would rather have seen this a hundred times before I watch the next match one more time. Super Loco in Aguila? Well, that was the next match. It was the first match in the light heavyweight tournament. Sunny came out to do ring announcing in an outfit that she is the only person in the history of the world who could get away with this. So Super Loco, better known as Super Crazy from, Crazy from ECW, did about 200 moves, botched most of them. I got to talk about the best one ever. <laughs> Super Loco. Mm -hmm. That's before he learned English. Hits the ropes. Super? 
And he's going to run, and he's going to do the deal where you basically do a flare flop in the middle of the ropes, and you go over the top, and you end up on the apron. His buddy, Aguila, uh-huh. or Aguilar, as Brian Christopher called him on commentary, <laughs> he's outside the ring, and they've got a long shot so that you can see all of this, everybody's reaction in all of its glory. Loco hits the ropes, and he runs with a head of steam, and he just fucking... Gets tangled up in the ropes. <laughs> I didn't even know how to describe this. He gets tangled up in the ropes like he's a, a spider. Actually, mm-hmm. not the spider. He's, he's the, fly. the prey. He's, fly. he's, he's fly. the fly in the spider web. He's flopping around. He's kicking. He's tangled up in the ropes. He's in there for like an eternity. And finally, he falls out and he just falls on his ass right in the, right in the middle of the ring. And Brian Christopher laughs so loud and so hard and so long. This is the funniest thing he's ever seen. I laughed. I laughed and laughed and laughed. The crowd is all over the guy. And I, in my mind, at that instant, I'm thinking, nothing could be worse than this. If you're trying to visualize this, imagine Fred Flintstone jumping into a hammock. And it's yeah, spinning. That's good. You know. So he falls on his ass. And Brian Christopher laughs in such a way that this guy will never have a career in this country again. I'm laughing. The fans are laughing. Super crazy is on his ass. And he looks up. And he looks at the people. And he just shrugs. Yep. And then he jumps to his feet. And he vaults over the top rope. And now he's going to just jump off the apron. Right. He was supposed to be on the apron in the first place. So to recap... This fucking guy runs, gets wrapped up in the ropes, falls on his ass like a complete, absolute numbskull. He vaults over the top rope. His next move is to jump in the air to do a double sledge, and his buddy moves, and he smashes into the guardrail and falls down. The biggest fucking geek ever. (laughs) In 19 years, and believe me, they've tried. There is not one man in WWF slash WWE that has been a bigger fucking geek than this guy in this spot right here. I don't care what anybody says. Wow. Dolph, on his best day, could not be this big a geek. There's more. Do you know I watched this 85 times? <laughs> I, I, I laughed harder every time. So, Super Loco crotches Aguila on the top rope. And goes to do a springboard kick to the back of the head. And this is the key. The back of the head. Because he missed this kick to such an epic degree that Agula didn't even know he had passed by and didn't sell or react at all. There was no question by anyone in the world that Super Loco had just missed this kick. This brings me to one James E. Cornette. <laughs> Before we get to Cornette, I just gotta add one more thing. If you're Agula... And this guy fucks that rope thing up so badly. Right. It looks like such a goddamn idiot. Can you not just stand there and let him do the double sledge? Instead of moving, which is the plan, and make him look like ten times as big a geek. They did mention over and over and over that Agula was 19 here. Yeah. Well, what's Super Loco's excuse? I'm just saying maybe Agula didn't have the uh Well, obviously he didn't, but so. come on. Poor guy. Well, he was 19 here. They had high hopes for him. They were pushing him as the hottest star to come out of Mexico since Milmask or whatever. That was a lie. It was, but the but it was, it was what you got to do if you get to sign a guy and I push him. Now, Super Loco is just crap in the bed left and right. He's ruining everything. And he finally misses this kick and falls on his ass, and both men look stupid. And we get to Cornette. And I know there's a lot of people who don't like Cornette. I know he's he's got his, he's an opinionated man, and sometimes those opinions, as he himself says, ruffle some feathers. But you know what? He's a fucking genius. Because he turns on a dime and says, you know what? He's missing all those moves because he's trying to match Agula at his own game. And no one can stop Agula at his own game. He turned this disaster, or at least tried to, he tried to turn this disaster into a push for the guy they were pushing. I never would have thought of this in a hundred years. That's an I never would have bothered. <laughs> <laughs> That's the difference. This match was so bad that the man changed his name and went to a different company after this. He changed his name many times. He was Poppy Chulo. He was S.A. Rios. I was talking about Super Loco. Oh, yeah. Uh, let's see. Agula won with, believe it or not, a Sparkle Splash. Yeah, that was the finish. And sparkle I, Splash. And I believe his music was the Brawl for All theme. 
We have that to look forward to, by the way. What a goddamn disaster this was. This but it was beautiful. Is, I loved every second of it. It was a beautiful disaster. And the funniest thing... Have you watched Raw yet? No. You always ask this, and the answer is always no. Well, you're not going to see it, because they're not going to put it on Hulu, but Goldberg, in his first move in night, in 12 oh, years... <laughs> poor guy. He's, he's just way too excited. And he starts brawling with Rusev. He throws one knee, and he falls right on his ass, and the guy falls on top of him. They're yeah. just tumbling around. Ah, oh, bummer. We saw five straight minutes of that in this match. Uh -huh. Anyway, as I was saying, the funniest thing about this, this was the only match that they had in hour number one on Raw. Huh. Didn't realize that, but wow. All right. Ross repeats the line about Goldust raping his wife of her dignity. And we get a sit-down interview on what had to be somebody's grandmother's couch. Yeah, it was bad. <laughs> There's no way these two people picked out this furniture. They're both dressed all in black. So they could not mention Brian Pillman by name, but they were talking about the angle where she was away from her family for a month. Talked about how, how hard it had been, how great it was to be a family again, and Dustin is just sitting there scowling the whole time. And they showed Dakota playing in the pool, and Marlena says mommy is back from a long vacation. And then Dustin interrupts and says he can't do this anymore, this is making him sick. He said he spent his whole life living for his dad, and the last few years living for his wife, and after seven years... Every time he did something wrong, she'd scold him like a puppy dog, and she had no idea who he really was. And he let her know, while she had been away for 30 days, he had not been sitting at home playing Mr. Dad. He had reached out and found someone who understood him, and let him be who he wanted to be. Do you know that for the absolute life of me, I have no idea who he's talking about? Oh, you will remember. Isn't it Luna? Yes. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So he, uh... She's asking why he's doing this here and now and starting to cry. And he says he's starting his life over and living for himself. And she can take this ring and this marriage of Marlena and shove it up her ass. He walked out. And this sucked. God, it was so bad. It was such, like, can I watch something else? It was fucking horrible. Uh -huh. This didn't even the, make any sense. No. This is the only time my wife walked into the living room as I'm watching. Oh, naturally. Yeah, yeah of course. Yeah. Yeah, this was horrible. Yes. But it was followed. By the greatest hype video in years. Truth. Shawn Michaels, Bret Hart, Survivor Series, 1997 Montreal video package. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but some of the original music was in there, but some of it they changed. Am I wrong about that? I couldn't tell you. I watched this thing a billion times. I could have sworn there was some different music, but it doesn't matter. Video package is wondrous. It's wonderful. It goes all the way back to WrestleMania 18 months earlier, the Iron Man match, and all the fallout. Sean's, uh, in fact, even before some of these promos they aired actually were for, for to hype up that match. So we have Brett talking about how much he hates Sean's twirling and dancing in that Mexican style of wrestling. <laughs> it was such a great <laughs> delivery. Man, he should be on Trump's campaign. He made him sick. It's Mexican style of wrestling. He compared himself. Sickening. Tough men like truckers and coal miners and lumberjacks. They don't want to see a pretty boy wearing leather and mirrors, a little heart tattoo. They want to see a guy in pink tights. He didn't say that part. Then someone here, they had the promo of Sean in the ring calling Brett Mark Man. He said, you really believe everything belongs to you. They had one, something about how Sean says it gets going and then you got to be better than the other guy at everything. I'm pretty sure that's what he said, but he slurred his way through that fucking sentence. I couldn't believe they put that in the video. <laughs> the very last thing we heard here was Michael Cole doing narration, saying, After this Sunday, it'll all be over. <laughs> <laughs> Little did he know. That is both totally true and yet totally false. Because <laughs> it was replayed over and over and over again. Then they go to Jim Ross. He's just begging fans to buy this pay-per-view, and he says... It will probably never, ever happen again. I certainly encourage you to join us for this history-making event. That's true. Ahmed Johnson then made his entrance, which pissed off the announcers, because he was not scheduled. They go to break. When they come back, out comes Kane. Kane destroys poor Ahmed, who barely went up for the choke slam. So Kane sets off his pyro and hits two tombstones. Uh, Ahmed did not trust Kane to hit these tombstones. He was twisting his neck way, head way out to the side. So there's really nothing else to do. And his head may have come within a foot of the mat on either one of them. I'm not sure. 
So mankind then runs out. He knocks Kane down with a metal pipe or something. Kane does the zombie setup. Mankind grabs a chair. Geeks hold him back, and that's the end of that. Austin comes out for a promo. Can I talk about what I loved about this Austin segment? He uses an open challenge. He's willing to fight anybody. So nobody comes out for a while. He wants a beer and a pizza or a hot dog or whatever. And finally, they hit the nation's music. And the nation comes out, and the fans are chanting, Rocky sucks, and it's one against four. So Austin's in the ring, and they send in comma, but there's still three dudes outside. Also now comes Legion of Doom. They attack the nation. And in this wild melee, Steve Austin gives Kama a stunner. Mm -hmm. And then what does he do? <laughs> he leaves. Yeah. He gets the fuck out of there. Because I believe that Austin has said this before. On this show, he's not an idiot. <laughs> that is a very important key to the popularity, the lasting popularity, of Steve Austin. His character... He went out there and he talked a bunch of shit, but he was not an idiot. I like nowadays when these guys come out and they challenge four guys, and then four guys come out and they beat the shit out of the guy, and he looks like a goddamn idiot because he challenged four guys. And they think, oh, the man showed guts. No, he showed he was a goddamn moron. Austin never did that. He challenged a guy, four guys came out, he beat up one of them during a melee, and then he ran for the hills. He walked by the melee of LOD and the rest of Legion of, or the LOD and the Nation of Domination, and he was snickering. Yeah, at the melee that he had caused. That's right, but he didn't get involved. No, he's like, I'm getting the hell out of here. Smartest man in the room. Had a Shawn Michaels promo. First, Rick Rude come out and came out and did the introduction. God, Rick Rude was so great. Every week he's greater, and he's about to leave. <laughs> he's like, I hope you enjoy my last. Oh, I'll still be around for a while. Just on the other show. Am I the only one who thought Shawn Michaels in a t-shirt, leather jacket, slicked back hair, and these sunglasses looked like the Jackal? Mm. Kind of. It's more like the Jackal often looked like Shawn That's Michaels. probably true. So uh, fans were, of course, saying mean things about Shawn's sexuality, so he kissed Hunter and China. They bullied Cole, sent him out of the ring, and then Shawn went off about how he was the icon who could still go... He started playing air guitar with his belt as Hunter buried WCW guys. I was there thinking, this is dumb. I asked myself, are we building to a Shawn Michaels Hulk Hogan match? And I realized technically the answer is yes. <laughs> it just took a long time to get there. And what a payoff. Yeah. Shawn said he had cracked people up last week. That was nothing compared to next week when he would walk naked down to the ring and show Ken Shamrock who was really the world's most dangerous man. They demanded Sergeant Slaughter come down and make that official. So as Slaughter's coming out, Vince is going on about how Slaughter has forbidden Sean from, and this is also a quote, dropping his trow or anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> how do you do that? <laughs> Tell him you'll be suspended? Well, if you lose if you lose grip of it, you could drop it at any time. It's Well, if you suspend it, you can suspend durs and then his, his trows won't fall down. You gotta hold on to your trow. Yeah. Important lesson in life, that. So Sarge begins to speak, and this is the very famous promo where DX first puts on masks, like a painter's mask. I don't know what these are. It's just a face shield that you would use in a metal shop. or be, A it, welder would have one of these. No, he would not. But it would be, <laughs> you know. It's a face shield. It's a yeah. plastic face shield. Paint. I once welded, Craig. You paint. didn't use one of these. You used No, I used one that shield. had the dark shield. But yes. it's the same fucking thing. You're it's, avoiding sparks into your face. No, it's not. Yeah. Anyway, go the ahead. Sparks would have burnt through these. Plastic what do you think those damn fire. windshield wipers? Then are they put for? the windshield wipers the sparks. on. Sparks. Can we move on? Let's talk about how awesome Sean was as he's blatantly looking at the Titan Tron. Yes, through his wipers, and laughing at himself. So Sarge finally says, "You're not going to wrestle Shamrock next week. You're going to wrestle him tonight." That's that. Maybe that's how Sean got his lazy eye. He was trying to. Look at the guy he's talking to and the Titan Tron at the same time, and it got worse over the years. So it was a 15 year illness that slowly came on. That's right. That actually know. makes sense to me. <laughs> no, he got punched in the goddamn eyeball. Yeah. It showed Mark Merrow yanking Sable out of the dressing room. How are you missing the absolute best part of this? Where when it's over, Sable? Sean grabs the mic after the match has been signed 
And he's in the middle of a rant, and all of a sudden he just stops. I don't know if they cut his mic or what happened. Yes, okay. He just stops, and he's gobsmacked. And he stands, and he looks at the Titan Tron, looks at himself. And then he kind of looks around some more. And he's just absolutely befuddled. And he says, you can't say that to me. I'm Shawn Michaels. And I thought, who said what? <laughs> what are you talking about? But his reaction to whatever happened was great. That's the thing about... Sean reminds me, it's like the Young Bucks. When it's time to sell, boy, does this guy sell. As we saw later on tonight as well. Mm -hmm. They were being such dicks the whole segment. And finally, the baby face said something. And they sold it great. They didn't laugh it off. They did not. When they heard they had to wrestle Shamrock tonight, they were not happy. No. And this thing, it, it, my impression was... Like, they started playing the raw graphic on the screen, and maybe Sean thought they'd gone to commercial, and he'd been cut off. I think that's exactly what happened. That, that's, that's my impression. So that happens when you look at the goddamn Titantron all the time. That, that's a lesson to him. Yeah. yeah. That he did not learn. So, then Mark Mero yanked Sable out of the dressing room, even though she had not yet put her top on, and we got some very impressive side boob before she covered up. This led to Savio Vega versus Mark Mero. God. You follow that DX segment with Savio Vega versus Mark Mero. And it's funny because every week I go off on this, and it's always involving Mark Mero, and I have nothing against Mark Mero. He just always happens to be in the segment where I realize millions of people are switching the channel right now. Yeah. What occurred to me here is I have long been aware that they brought Ken Shamrock in from UFC and for about two matches, he was something unique and special and soon became just like every other pro wrestler except he wore fighting gloves. What I did not recall was at the exact same time, they were doing the exact same thing with Mark Merrow. They tell us he's gone back to his boxing roots. He's taping his fists and wearing boxing trunks. And he gets in there and does like two punches, then he's just a wrestler. Running the ropes, flipping around, flying around. Just killing the gimmick, killing the same gimmick twice in the same show. Now, Shamrock was still a lot better than Mark Merrow, so he survived. He, got, he survived this gimmick killing. I love that this is absolutely not news to anybody who's paid any attention, but they're breaking up Gold Dust and Marlena in storyline. They end up getting a divorce. They're breaking up Mark Merrow and Sable in storyline. Uh -huh. They're getting a divorce. Yeah. They're putting Hunter and China together. They get together. And later they put Hunter and Stephanie together and they got married. They split up Mongo and Deborah. Mm -hmm. They got divorced. Yeah. They split up Sullivan and Nancy, yeah. and they got divorced. Uh -huh. they, put, I mean, they put Nancy and Benoit together. They seriously, got together. it became an IQ test. <laughs> like, after about 97, 98, yeah. if they tell you that you and your wife are breaking up, you say, fuck you, I quit. Mm -hmm. Don't go along with it. No. No, 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 no. So, Mero won with the low blow in the TKO. Then Michael Cole, of course, tried to interview Sable, and Mero put a stop to that right away. Vader versus Bulldog in a dog collar match for no goddamn reason. What the fuck was this? Like, what the fuck? They kept going on and Did on. Did something about... happen at a pay per view that we missed? I mean, that must have happened. They kept going on and on about Team America and Team Canada and blah, 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 blah. And, and the Patriots now hurt and we don't see him ever again. Hey, it's let's just... think about this. How many times have we been watching Nitro and there's two cruiserweights? having a great match and they cut away so they can interview Hulk Hogan in the NWO or right. something of that nature. Mm -hmm. Here we had the British Bulldog and the man they call Vader having a stipulation match that involved hanging and they cut away from it to interview Furnace and LaFon. Right. Let me go back just a second. <laughs> well, yeah. I, yes. Are you kidding me? I get your point. I, I totally get your point. So, this was to hype a Team USA versus Team Canada Survivor Series match mm -hmm. that they were announcing in the segment. That's true. They booked a Bulldog Vader dog collar match. As the match was going on, they announced, essentially in these words, this match is a hyper Survivor Series match, which we are announcing right this second. This felt like, as a guy who watches uh, in 2016 the Hulu version of Raw, this feels like this match must have been booked on a segment I skipped, or they got cut. But there was no Hulu Raw in 1997. This is how it came off on TV, and it was awful. Now, here is the match, everyone. <laughs> it's Team USA, of which I only know three people. Vader, Mark Merrow, and Goldust. What a team. 
and some fourth person. They are facing Team Canada, which includes Furnace and the Fawn, British Bulldog, and Jim Neidhart. Team Canada has one Canadian. So. Well, the Fawn noted he's from Canada. They, 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 that, that was the only good part of this entire segment. Furnace from Oklahoma. When they go to interview Furnace and the Fawn, why That's have like you... Canada. Why have what? <laughs> Why have you joined Team Canada? Planes everywhere. And Phil Lafon looks at him and just says, in in perfect delivery, "I am Canadian, you idiot." He's right. Furnace explains the U.S. fans do not appreciate them like everyone else around the world, so they were joining Team Canada. So the build of this sucked. The match sucked. The fact they went to interview Furnace and Lafon sucked, and then the finish sucked. <laughs> it was so bad that in this stupid touch the four corners rules. Yes, it's a dog collar match. You know, like Piper and Valentine had. Not at all like that, actually. <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's the dog collar match. Yeah. And in this one, they decided to use the strap match rules. Yes. Where you touch the four corners. And it was so boggled, and the announcers were paying so little attention, they didn't realize the fourth corner had been touched until after it happened. It was only McMahon, uh, the owner of the company. All that matters is this sucked, but we did get the debut. Oh, that's right. Of Steve Blackman. I forgot about this. Who they pretended was a wild fan. Who's mm -hmm. that guy, they said? <laughs> They'd come out of the crowd to beat up all of the actual professional wrestlers. I think wrestlers. he's the fourth guy, Vince. Probably, yeah, I forgot about it until now. So, yes, the fan uh, started beating up the heels. To get this angle over, Vader tackled the fan and smothered him. So the heels all just put the boost to Vader for a while. And the fan was led away. And yes, it was the debut of the lethal weapon, Steve Blackman. The real reason the Monday Night Wars turned around. Hmm. <laughs> Pause right, for laughter. Fine. Billy Gunn and Road Dog against the Bariquas. I yeah. know you're thinking, Craig. It was horrible. They were, in fact, telling Billy Gunn that he was a ferret. Yes. And All what time. was funny is on Nitro, they were telling Alex Wright that he was a ferret. That's right. And it may have taken place at the exact same time. And if not, perhaps they're calling Sean a ferret. There's a lot of ferrets in 1997, it turns out. So let's cut to the chase. It sucked. And I don't even know who won. We got... <laughs> Does it matter? Without question, the funniest moment in all of 1997 during this match. Road Dog has an no, abdominal stretch. that was stretch. in the opener. Road Dog has, has an abdominal stretch. And Billy Gunn is pulling out his hand for leverage from the outside. Uh -huh. And the ref almost catches them, so they stop. And they, 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 they stop holding hands, and Billy Gunn turns to jaw jack with the fans for a while. Road Dog does not know Billy Gunn is jaw jacking. So he reaches back behind him, and no one grabs his hand. So he reaches a little bit farther. No one grabs his hand. He's leaning back now in this abdominal stretch, trying to get Billy to grab his hand. And there's no Billy. And finally, he slowly turns his head. Like, where in the hell did this guy go? And Billy comes running up the apron to grab his hand for half a second. I laughed, and I laughed, and I laughed, and I laughed, and I laughed. Then, when I went back back to watch this... Super Loco was way funnier. Now, <laughs> I realized that in the interim between the first hand-holding and the time Road Dog tried to hold his hand and didn't work, he's got him with this abdominal stretch, he's got his right hand free. First, he just puts a finger in the Bariqua's belt loop, <laughs> which does nothing, but he's pulling on his jeans. And then he pinched his armpit. <laughs> Just Are we hand. really wasting three minutes on this goddamn match? I laughed. Uh, they won when Billy came off the top rope and put Rody on top for the win. Thank you. Now we can talk about a match. Yes, sir. Okay, well, not deny the main event was better. Shawn Michaels and Ken Shamrock. And Shawn comes out, and he just sells everything for this guy early. Bouncing all over the place like a ping pong ball. Screaming spots at the top of his lungs <laughs> yes, the went. entire time. Close line! You know what I got to mention about this? I'm not going to go off on Sasha again, but this goes for a lot of people in wrestling nowadays. There was one very badly botched spot early, and they did like a bunch of reversals. I don't even know what the plan was, but I do know that Sean got hip-tossed, and he didn't land in the middle of the ring. Nope. He got hip-tossed, and he hit his leg on the ropes, and boy, you could see he was pissed off. Because you bump in the middle of the fucking ring. You don't bump into the ropes. You don't bump into the corner. You don't get drop kicked into the corner. You don't do any of that stuff because when you get drop kicked, for example, in the corner, you have nowhere to bump. 
Or when you take the overhead belly to belly or whatever into the corner and you hit the turnbuckle and fall on your head, you got nowhere to go. In the old days, that was bullshit if someone did that to you. Right. Now it's become a spot. That's the hardest part of the ring, Brian. You're going to see so many guys suffering so many injuries and being all handicapped when they get older. So, yes, that happened. I think someone's supposed to fly out of the ring. And I did see him shoot a look at Vince, although through his hair, I actually thought he was laughing about the whole thing. Uh, let's see. What was the other big fuck up? Because this was the, the fascinating thing about this was you had an all time great worker against a very, very talented, but very, very green guy who just didn't know what to do a lot of the time. So Sean whips him in and goes to throw the knee to the gut. And he the, the initial plan was Shawn, uh, Shamrock would do a small package, but he didn't know what to do. So he just stops running and Sean is hopping on one foot, holding up his leg, waiting for Shamrock to hit the small package. Eventually he did. You know why Shawn Michaels is better than me? Yes. Do you want, do you I want know to that, get the I list out? I know that out? most people can't figure it out, but I'll explain it, okay? If I would have had this match with Shamrock, it would have been super idiot-proofed. But Sean was a guy who, he was gonna idiot-proof the match, but goddammit, you were still gonna work his match. And so, that's why they had that one botched spot. Because Sean, as he's screaming spots, he was still determined to do all of these spots with the guy. Whereas I would have taken out 80% of the spots and just done... Nothing that could be screwed up by Ken Shamrock. Because I wouldn't want to get killed, and I wouldn't want the guy to kill me. Not Sean. He was going to drag a match out of this guy, and he got a hell of a match out of him. And if I recall, he got an even better one out of him at the Degeneration X pay-per-view. Right. And Shamrock was only one month more advanced. But Sean just, we're going to run fast, we're going to do these spots quick, you got to be listening, and you got to be on your toes, and we're going to do this. And he dragged a match out of the guy. That's why this guy was awesome. Took risks. That's true. <laughs> These are high risk moves. Wrestling with Ken Shamrock. So Shamrock tried his Frankensteiner. Michaels caught him for what had to be the only power bomb of his career. And then Shamrock also fucked up the finish, but was still able to get shot on the ankle lock. And they went through all the trouble of distracting the ref. So Rook hit him with a briefcase. And then Hunter could attack him for the DQ anyway. Well, the key was that Sean tapped. Which helped set up the Degeneration X pay-per-view. I see. They laid Shamrock out with a pedigree on the briefcase, and that is how the go-home show for Montreal ended. Yes, it did not end with Shawn Michaels, the challenger for the world title, going into that match, hitting a super kick on Shamrock. It was Hunter hitting his move on a briefcase. Because some things never change. Nitro. Raw 233, November 10th, 1997, the day after Survivor Series. <laughs> Ironic. <laughs> I can't even... Just gonna say. So there's a big rowdy crowd there in Ottawa, Canada. And they all got quiet because it was time for the debut of the greatest pro wrestling theme song of all time. The DX theme for the very first time. For a while, no one was sure what to make of it. Because there's an intro, but there's no hint of who's in it. And then Hunter and Sean appear and they were kind of a mix of cheers and boos no one was still quite sure what had happened the night before keep in mind everyone 20 years ago there was no twitter facebook there was no observer.com only a very small very 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 small percentage had any idea of what the finish of montreal had actually been about that's actually not true mm. i will i will give you a history lesson since i was right in the middle of this so, the internet was nothing like it was today, but there were news groups. Rec Sport Pro Wrestling was one of them. And while there was no WrestlingObserver.com, there was the Wrestling Observer Hotline, there was the Torch Hotline, there were a lot of free hotlines that you could call that would update their story after they called the other two hotlines. <laughs> and so, suffice to say, if you watch the shows, I mean, it was patently clear that everybody in the business knew everything that happened yes i mean there were jokes made all all throughout the show sean made jokes about punching vince and eric was making jokes about vince getting knocked out gene is selling the hotline i mean i don't remember how much money was made on this particular night but suffice to say a lot of money was made from people covering the montreal screw job the observer came out a week later and then everyone really knew what was going on but there were nowhere near... It's not like this happened today. If this happened today, everybody would know about it the next morning. But 
it was not totally obscure. But there were plenty of fans. There were probably, in the building, probably 2% of the fans knew what was going on. That was my point. But. I remember watching this with you in my living room in my first or second rental house. And after the screw job happened, I remember looking at you and you looked at me and kind of puzzled look on my face. You said, something's not right. <laughs> Indeed. I called it. You did. You called it. I called it years ago. Bret Hart was screwed. Actually, as we've determined, Bret screwed Bret. We, I think we made that clear a few radio shows ago. But By yeah. not tapping out to Ken Shamrock clean for the title? By the way, everybody wanted us to review the match again, and yeah. I don't think anybody watched it, but I've watched it many times, and it was just a match. Yeah. Nothing special. It was like a three and a quarter star match, yes. maybe, with it, a fucked up finish. It is much better than <laughs> you think it would be, considering two guys who legit hated each other. There's nothing like... like watching Hell in a Cell back. No. And actually, it's exactly as good as it was at the time. It's no better or worse. It I was don't think... just an average match between Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels. Clearly the worst one they ever did. Yeah. I was going to say, didn't they have a much better Survivor Series match like five years prior? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. They had all sorts of great matches. They had many great matches. Tag matches. Anyway, so Rick Rude comes out. He is booed out of the building, can't get through his spiel. He begins to boast about Shawn Michaels' championship win. And then we got the DX theme a second time. And Shawn, Hunter, and China came out admiring their video. Jim Ross mentioned that the title had been stolen from Bret Hart. And that Bret Hart had, in fact, left the WWF. So Shawn takes the mic, says he had thought about being politically correct, but somebody else had drawn first blood. So he was going to unload on everyone. Fans could chant they wanted Brett all they wanted, but the fact was Sean had beat him with his own hold in his own country. And if they, if they thought DX had been hard to deal with before, they hadn't seen anything yet. He said the WWF was not big enough for heartbreak for the heartbreak kid and for Shawn Michaels. That's what he said. Yep. So he had set Brett down south with the rest of the dinosaurs, and the only guys there who were not dinosaurs were his friends, and they would beat Brett up sooner or later. By the way, now despite all of this promo, by the way, I should note that Sean at this point was still insisting he had nothing to do with it. He didn't know what was going on. He for years. was completely innocent. He was just an innocent bystander, unaware of all of this. He was just as mad, probably not just as mad as, as Brett, <laughs> but he was mad that his match got ruined because they screwed the guy without telling him. And if you're watching this and you hear Shawn Michaels say, I, I sent Brett Hart down south to be beat up by my two friends, aren't you immediately turning the television? <laughs> That's a good call. Uh, let's see. Uh, they said they had talent. Let's see. He had a talent that Hogan, Savage, and Brett never did. Rude said Sean would never quit, and then Ken Shamrock's music played, but as his music was playing, Sean still said into the mic and into the camera that no matter what, he would never beat up a 52-year-old man. Not sure he could. <laughs> Bad track record. About in this these time... fisticuff battles. About this time, a fan in the crowd held up a sign, and it said, and I quote, Helmsley, Mid card for life. <laughs> well, that guy was more wrong than I was about the screw job. Bet you he's blushing now. So Sean was sure to cut a promo with Hunter and Rude standing in front of him so he could act all brave. He said, I'm going to give you the mic, Ken, just to see if you can string a sentence together. Called him a disgrace to the human race. Hey, the guy strung a sentence together. He did fine. He, questions China's, he questioned China's gender, so they cross chopped her in front of him. <laughs> he cut a promo you could not cut in 2016. No. Maybe now. Mm. Get you elected now. Sorry, I, I stay with that. <laughs> Hunter flicked him off right in front of the camera. Shamrock called Rick Rude... What the Rude, fuck do people expect on this show tonight? I don't know. <laughs> Shamrock called Rick Rude an old man, and I thought, you know, Rude wouldn't win, but that'd be a fun fight. So he's going to punch a hole in Sean's chest. Sean took over, and he started with a head of steam, but by the end it was clear that he was not operating at 100%. You know, granted, Rick Rude's dead and has been for a long time, but if he had not died and Rick Rude and Ken Shamrock would have fought in, say, 2010, i put my money on Rude. Really? Yeah! Mm -hmm. Ken Shamrock in 2010? Oh, 2010? Yeah. Okay, yeah. He Ken did, couldn't beat you! He had taken a, a, some, a lot of beatings. And pills. Let's see. Uh, Sean said China was a woman who could knock Shamrock out. How, where did this go? Slaughter came out. <laughs> He's still oh, making man. I talk about it every week. Our main man, Sergeant Slaughter. He can't do anything right. 
bumbles his way out there, talks about the World Federation Championship, right. slobbers all over himself, and finally signs Triple H versus Ken Shamrock tonight. And he's supposed to announce that Sean is going to face Ken at some point. He doesn't mention it. Sean wants to know when it is. He still can't spit it out. Yes. And the goddamn segment ended, and we never found out when he was going to face him. Right. He, he, he said, Shamrock would get a title match, but not tonight. And then gave no further information. Ahmed Johnson versus Mark Merrow. <sighs> okay. I said this last week. I've been right a lot lately. <laughs> Missed on a few big ones, but... I am not wrong when I say that Ahmed Johnson's continued employment is a far bigger affront to this business than Roman Reigns being pushed as a baby's face for three straight years. This was the worst fucking match, maybe of all of 1997. It was so bad. Ahmed was absolutely horrible. Why anybody thought it would be a good idea to put this match together is beyond me. Just fucking hideous. Well, like three minutes, he was still totally blown up at the end. And then Mero hit a low blow right in front of the ref for the DQ. For the DQ, great finish because we can't beat Ahmed Johnson. And he tried the TKO, but Ahmed, Ahmed was too big and too shitty to go up. He tried it twice. Mm -hmm. He tried it once and it got fucked up. Slid he off. tried it again. Look, all you got to do is find a way to get on the fucking guy's shoulders. Right. Ahmed could not figure this out. Ahmed's on his back like a fucking turtle shell. Mark Merrow's bent all the way over like he's got a goddamn coffin on his back. And finally, Merrow's like, fuck you, dude. And he just spins and helicopters the guy to the mat. It's Even that's still charitable. happening. Yeah. He just a, fell down. It's the worst judo throw I've ever seen. Yeah. It's the worst anything I've ever seen. He Match. <laughs> move. Segment. He showed butter bean in the crowd. I guess Cosby's had a garage sale and the sweater picked up the sweater. Mm. Talking Mitch Noko versus Devin Storm in the light heavyweight tournament. Uh, Sunny at this point is just the full-time light heavyweight tournament announcer. That's just what her job is now. So I believe last time we saw Devin Storm, he was having a match with Conan on Nitro. <laughs> the last time I saw him, he had one of the so. worst matches in history. Remember that? Was it that one? I don't know if it was that one, but I do remember there was a Devin... Maybe it was on Raw. Has he had? A, I think he may have had a Raw match. Actually. I think he had a Raw match, and I think that's what I'm thinking of. It was just... Abysmal. Was it against Scotty Too Hotty? It may have been. Well, I'm thinking of the Nitro match here because my I remember I vividly rem remember my takeaway from the Nitro match was this guy's moving a million miles an hour all the time and won't slow down at all, and that is what he was doing here. Hit a move, pick him up. 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 Throwing the shittiest roundhouse kicks of all time. Oh. Announcers making fun of his nose. You no, know, there were a lot of problems in this match. There were. He is right about that. I wrote down. Uh, here's a. a a brief sample, only a, 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 a taste of what we had in this three minute match. Death Valley Driver, Missed Moonsault, a bunch of cutoffs, a horrendous spin kick by Taka, a drop kick to Christopher, who was not in the match, a Mitch Nuka Driver for the win, a dive onto Christopher, and he ran to the back to save his life. And you forgot the top rope spin kick that Taka threw and hit Devin Storm in, in the, the leg, yeah. <laughs> hey, let's be fair. It was not terrible. It went too long. It was better than Ahmed Johnson and Mark Merrill. <laughs> well. <laughs> They recapped Goldust dumping Marlena last week. And Goldust came out for an interview with his face painted black and F you and gold in his cheeks and I'm first on the back of his head. He's got a new paint job and a <laughs> completely preposterous outfit. He's dressed like a mattress or something. He's got, uh, he's got... <laughs> F you on his face for forever unchanged. He's got, uh, he's got, um, yes. Hugh Hefner's smoking jacket. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dipped yeah. in gold. My wife bought me a gi, I think it was for Christmas, and it's the color of the blinds right here, like a velvety red, and every time I put it on, I feel like I'm Hugh Hefner. Hmm. It's like a giant, it is like a giant smoking jacket. Can't get it up. How dare you, Craig? <laughs> Sorry. How dare you? So, what are you being... talking about anyway? Go ahead, Vinny. Was quite bewildered by this Goldust fellow. So, Goldust had walked out on his team in Survivor Series, which... It annoyed Vader. Vader came out. Golda said, I had a broken arm. I was not cleared to wrestle. Now, obviously, he's a lying chicken shit heel. But come on. <laughs> he was out there in the ring. Let's see. Golda said nothing to say, so Vader grabbed him and powerbombed him, and then it was to the back. Michael Cole, yes? I'm just... 
<laughs> the fuck was gold dust? What was this? I don't know. The, the ensemble was capped off with these dangly golden earrings. It was amazing. Oh my gosh. As, this was 19 years ago, and gold dust is still working today. Uh-huh. And he's... I mean, I have seen him recently without his paint on, and he looks a thousand years old. Uh-huh. But when you put the damn paint on the guy, he moves great. He's a totally fine worker. He's so much better now than he was when he was 19 years younger. Yeah. This was a rough time for Gold Dust. <laughs> Clearly. Not as rough as when he was in TNA. Ugh. And he had that rat or something. And he was maybe what the hell was pounds. he? Black Rain. Black, Black Rain. Rain. He, had a, he had a mouse. Oh, Some kind of rodent in the cage. God. Michael Cole let us know the Blackjack Wyndham had been taken out while Blackjack Bradshaw was screaming they needed paramedics. Two jackasses that attacked his friend. Mm-hmm. That's what he said. Sounds like he's a zookeeper. Had the truth commissioned against the headbangers. Ugh. The DOA came out to be in the headbangers corner to get as many shitty wrestlers as possible into the segment. Jackal joined the announce desk. Match fucking sucked. Just guys interfering, going in and out of the ring for no reason. Jackal jumping on the apron, getting knocked down, going back to do more commentary. Jackal was very good, but he's going off about how he's a cult leader. He's going to save people from a sick society. Meanwhile, they have paired him with a random South African paramilitary squad. A bad fit. Let's see. One headbanger powerbound his partner onto a Truth Commission guy and pinned him. Jackal. And then a gang war broke out. Interrogator and DOA hit the ring for a brawl. They had this brawl. I'll talk about it more when we talk about Nitro, but... Man, oh man. You wonder why Nitro was winning. (laughs) God. (laughs) No, I don't. This fucking gang rules storyline. It's just like... Every week, these absolute nobodies are on screen having bullshit fights that it's impossible to care about. And by the way, this should have been... A, all these gang warfare things should have been decided the Sunday before. Because that was, was, it was gang rules. Right. Nothing got settled. And the worst part about all this, I think, is that if you pay attention to the commentary, all of this was to build it to interrogator versus crush. <laughs> that right. sounds terrible. <laughs> They recapped Steve Austin beating Owen Hart for the Intercontinental title at Survivor Series. Austin came out. He was cheered. Didn't say much until Rocky Maya V interrupted. Actually, he did say something. <laughs> he flat out said, I was on my couch drinking beer and doing jack shit for three months, and then I walked right back in and took the Intercontinental title. But yet he was on Raw. <laughs> really. What a weird thing to say. That's pretty close to the truth. Pretty close I to mean, the it quote. was. Yeah. It's just weird. I guess he was mad at the hearts, too. I don't know why. Mm. He was mad at Owen. It was a good way to bury him. So Rocky claimed he had been the best IC champion and the fans knew it. One way or another, he was getting his title back. And if Austin accepted his challenge, then the bottom line would be he was a has-been courtesy of The Rock. This was like the switch flipped with The Rock here. Uh He was way better on the mic this evening than he was the last time I saw him. And he had been good. He was all right, but he was like actually good in this promo he had already been getting the most heat in the nation segments just by doing nothing just by being out there and he came out here he changed his name i guess officially he said it to the microphone he is now the rock austin made fun of his hair accepted the challenge he said all these people are saying you suck you don't suck because they say you suck you suck because i say so and that's the bottom line rock was appalled by this i don't want to alarm you all but this steve austin rock promo segment was quite good Feud has begun. Jim Ross interviewed Steve Blackman at ringside. Ross said Blackman had looked great at Survivor Series, and Blackman says he's still learning the rules in the WWF. <laughs> the Barik was picked to fight with him. He kicked the ass and sent them packing. Okay, serious question here. Sure. Okay. This is a goddamn serious question. You know, as a radio show host, I could just, like, pretend I know everything, but I come out here in front of all of you people, and I admit when I don't know what's going on, I am belittled for it, but I don't care. Who the fuck was this Bariqua <laughs> that interrupted this thing here? There was... Who was this? I, I, I know there are four names. There was Savio Vega, who I know who he is. I know who sure. that is. Miguel Perez was the hairy the guy. The hairy right? guy. Right. Okay. The other two's names were Jose and Jesus. Right. Okay, which fucking guy was this? Not I thought clue. this was I a fan. Got no idea. Not like a fan, but I thought it was like, you know, a gimmick fan. Yeah. And I thought it was one of the Bariquas. I was like, who is this guy? Yeah. yeah. Which is ironic, too, because Blackman basically appeared out of the crowd. He 
quote unquote jump the rail and now he's in a wwe ring uh encouraging children everywhere if you just jump the rail and get into the ring you, you might be a star <laughs> yeah road dog and billy gunn were backstage they said blackjack you know what though let me say something about mm. that at least steve blackman was like all jacked up and sure. muscular and he looked like a wrestler right and most fans don't look like that. That's fair. This is very True. different from in WCW when in that age in a cage match, I believe that's the match, they had a plant who looked like a skinny fan right. do a run-in to mm -hmm. get beat up. And mm -hmm. that, Steve Blackman didn't do this, but that did encourage fans to start hitting the ring regularly in WCW because they did glorify it with people that looked like fans. At least Blackman looked like an action figure. Road Dog and Billy Gunn said Blackjack and Wyndham have been in the wrong place at the wrong time. That's true. And if Bradshaw was dumb enough to fight them two on one in a bunkhouse match, then he deserved what was coming to him. So we got not yet the New Age Outlaws versus Blackjack Bradshaw in a bunkhouse match. Bradshaw got a start in Texas, grew up watching Bruiser Brody, and it is very best Bruiser Brody impression here. Oh yeah, and it wasn't bad. No. Kicked their asses for a while. Weapon shots of plenty. Just grabbing anything that wasn't nailed down and attacking these two men with it. And finally, they cut him off, hit one DDT onto a chair, and dogpiled onto him for the win. And a disgusting chair shot to Road Dog. That was in there, too. And then Bradshaw no-sold everything, grabbed a snow shovel, and chased him to the back. <laughs> More of this awful Jeff Jarrett sit-down promo. <laughs> By the way, we had an unprotected chair shot to the head in that match, and another one at least... Actually, yeah, there was another one on Nitro. Mm -hmm. But it was not as bad it as... It was not oh. as bad as this one. Well, this one was bad, but there was another Nitro moment I cannot wait to discuss. So, Jeff points out he's never taken a steroid in his life. That was to be the greatest and most respected WWF champion of all time. He said he, obviously, this was taped prior to Survivor Series when he explained he had never beaten Bret Hart. And uh, beating Bret would prove he was the best, and that was important to him. He said Sean would, win, Sean would win at Survivor Series, so he got that. They're doing word association. Where Jim Ross lists names and Jerry gives his impression. He gets to Hulk Hogan. And Jerry thanks and thanks and thanks and comes up with charisma and intelligence equals success. Listen. He had neither. <sighs> I've had Jeff Jarrett on the show. Always been a nice guy. Seems like a friendly enough chap. This was so goddamn boring. It's awful. They're transitioning to the Attitude Era. And here's this fella doing an old school, soft spoken, southern babyface promo. As boring as humanly possible. And as you noted, it's pre taped. So, of course, he mentions that he wants to have a match with Bret Hart. <laughs> it's like, you couldn't edit that fucking thing off this thing right here. It was so boring. Mm hmm. <laughs> This is really terrible. There's no other way to describe it. It was just boring. And does it, do, did fans really care whether guys were on steroids or not? Like, he's mentioned that for two weeks now. I don't think they care Never now. taken a steroid <laughs> no. in my life. Like, great! <laughs> Michael Cole interviewed Butterbean. I, here, here's where I made the Cosby sweater joke, so Craig beat me to it. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, no worries. <laughs> you win. Uh, he started plugging his fight. He had a fight coming up at some point with somebody. I don't know who, when, or where. Yep. Mark Miller interrupted. He said, I'm the only real boxer here. I could knock Butterbean out in four rounds or less. And Butterbean, you never better never look at Sable again. And Bean, who looked exactly like Curly and the Three Stooges, is shrugging and confused and squealing. Mm -hmm. What's he doing? Over and over and over again. I'm well aware Butterbean would take my head off my body. God, he sounds bad here. Get Mike Tyson's voice. Worse. <laughs> this was not Lawrence Taylor and Bam Bam Bigelow. I wonder if when Butterbean was in the back, this is where they got the idea for Brawl for All. Oh. I wonder if Vince looked at the guy and thought, I bet if I did a tournament, the winner could knock this Butterbean out. My crew could knock this fat guy out. <laughs> this fat short guy. I don't know if he's short, but he looked, he looked like Humpty Dumpty. So, uh, Kama Mustafa versus The Undertaker. Remember a few years ago, or a few months ago, where Kama just beat The Undertaker clean? Yeah. No. You don't yeah, remember it was, that? It was a tag match, It right? was his debut. 
And he just uh, beat him. Tag match. It was a tag match. I yeah. kind of remember yeah. that now. It was ridiculous. Yes, it was ridiculous at the time. So well, they uh, remembered. Taker was great, everyone. Watching Taker run the ropes was a joy. And he not come out of the ring where the lights went out and Kane came out. Paul Bearer said it would be easy for Kane to go down and send Taker to eternal damnation. But he wanted Taker to suffer first. He demanded Taker accept a one-on-one -on -one challenge so Kane could prove he was superior. Taker threatened to rip Kane's throat out, or Paul's throat out. Told Kane this was not the place. Bearer is a disease. He knew his little brother was somewhere behind that mask of evil. And there was something good left in him. The Undertaker, looking for something good left in people. That's right. This was every movie about brothers ever. I will never fight my brother. I know there's good in you. You've got to get away from that guy. Which is funny, because the brothers I have known, I don't have a brother. Brian, you don't have a brother, but sets of brothers I have known, they love to fight. Oh, dude, I got, I got twin brothers in my class, and put those two together, and it's like... Ken Shamrock and Vader. Yeah. Get the hell out of here. Craig is biting his tongue. Well, my brother's... He's smaller than I am. Was Shocking, he, I know. Was he always smaller than you? Oh, yeah. Okay. See, what I have noticed, usually what happens is there's a point where brother A is bigger, and so he mm -hmm. beats the crap out of small brother every day. Right. And then suddenly around age 14, it, somehow it always works out this way, the little brother ends up bigger. Yeah, that never happened, but um, I have great respect for my brother. Okay. Same love him. Love him like... Oddly enough, a brother. Oh. Cool. Clearly he beat Craig's ass at some point. Just financially. Well. He's successful. Ah, I respect I him. Okay. Well, then, don't beat his ass. No, why would I? I have no, no, don't. <laughs> Take his money. That's why. <laughs> no. you, you probably have better luck. I mean, come on, Vinny. What a stupid statement. <laughs> better luck sucking up to him and getting gifts here and there. <laughs> no. Getting in his will is what you were going to say. I was, I was very cruel to my brother when he was younger. I remember putting a butter knife on See? the stove and See? turning the stove on and getting the butter knife hot and chasing around the house with it. See? Yeah. And, Psychopath. And then, oh, he's a you brother. know, then when I got married... brothers and, do. When I got married and grew up, I was like, dude, I'm sorry. I was an idiot. I was a jerk. I'm sorry. It's been... I'm glad you were deep. faster than me. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, yes, Kane Taker says, I will never fight you. Bear says, all the agony that we're going to cause will be Taker's fault. Kane off his pyro. Comma, never seen again. Match had no finish. Ken Shamrock versus Triple H. Immediately, fans began to chant for Brett, and I think this was the exact point in the show where they realized, holy shit, he really is gone. What's funny about it is the match starts, and as you note, they're chanting, we want Brett. And Jim Ross acknowledges it and says, well, you ain't gonna see him around here. Nope. <laughs> and then Lawler says, Bret Hart's going down south, and he'll be making three million a year. Yeah. And I'm like... What's the point of this right here? I'm right. point out how rinky-dink raw is. Are we pointing out how they got so much more money and they're stealing our talent? Like, I don't know. It was weird. <laughs> it was bad timing. Ross also said the end of the Survivor Series would be talked about for years. Little did he know. This match would not be talked about for years. No. Nothing happened. Uh, Rude went to interfere. Sarge pulled him down. Hunter blatantly punched out the ref. China tried to interfere. Sarge tackled her too. Sean comes running in, catches the briefcase in midair, he waffles Shamrock with it, the credits rolled, the ref counts to two, and the screen goes black. And as he was coming down for the third count, you saw somebody pulling yes. the ref out of the ring. Yes, I was watching this, and the timer's on the bottom of the iPhone thing, and I'm like, they got 40 seconds left, <laughs> and there's a comeback going on right now, so something better happen quick. And sure enough, in the span of like 40 seconds... Rude ran down, Slaughter tried to stop him, Hunter poked the eyes, KO'd the ref, belly to belly, ankle lock, China comes down, Sean runs down, KO with the briefcase. This is this is like 30 seconds, because mm -hmm. there's still more to come. So in the last 10 seconds, DX is standing there mocking Slaughter, who, by the way, ruled, DX, you're not allowed at ringside. Right. And then they just came down. Yeah. He tries to physically stop him, but he's fat and slow and old, so he's a failure at it. He looks like the biggest geek possible. The referee goes to count. A phantom pulls the referee out of the ring as the screen goes black. Uh -huh. And then the show's off the air. Right. <laughs> I'm like... Nothing got solved. Wow. Wow. Survivor Series has ended, and that was raw. That was, in fact, raw. What a disaster. <laughs> Much like last week, there was an hour and 15 minutes, and there was only one match that had happened. Yeah. 
Now let me talk about the beginning of Nitro because I got to tie it into the end of Raw. So that's what happened at the end of Raw. Right. That disaster. Nitro begins with the NWO and Bischoff and Hogan. They all come out and they've got Canadian flags. The announcers cannot figure out why. Why in the world do they have Canadian they flags? don't have a dollar ninety nine a minute. So first, Bischoff teases that he's going to introduce Brett, but instead he calls out Kevin Nash. Nash comes out and he cuts a promo. Anyway, I'll let Vinny recap all of that. But the point of this is, Bischoff is so goddamn cocky at this moment in the ring with all of these guys. And it's so easy to see why. He had Starcade coming up, Hogan versus Sting. Everybody knew this was going to be their biggest pay-per-view of all time, by miles, which it was. They just raided Bret Hart from WWE, WWF. That fucking company is in shambles. You watch Raw every week and it's a disaster with a few shining bright lights. But it's largely disaster. They appear to be on the edge of collapse. They're losing in the ratings war every single week. Their biggest star is Steve Austin, who the doctors have told, dude, you really shouldn't be wrestling. Your neck's fucked up and you should retire. But Austin doesn't give a fuck, and it's 1997, so they just let the guy wrestle. I mean, you can imagine why Bischoff thought, dude, I'm like months away from putting this fucking company out of business. Yeah. And he's getting so goddamn cocky. Mm hmm Let's go. Okay, Retro Raw 234, November 17th, 1997. You recall the last week, the main event ended after the show had gone off the air. So they showed the finish, which was Sergeant Slaughter getting in DX's face, face pussing... Sergeant Slaughter... Did he say pussing? Did you grab it? Sergeant Slaughter... Joey Styles got fired for that, by the way. Sergeant Slaughter got in DX's face and pushed Shawn Michaels down. Can we start the show over? <laughs> after all this rigmarole we went through, now you're going to start it over? Because of all the things... Brian's what the hell going on? got a ghost in it. Jesus Christ! There's a ghost in the machine. Why? Alright, seriously. Anyway, Shamrock cradled Sean and Sarge counted three. They made it clear this was not an official decision in the Helmsley-Shamrock match. Good to know. But it had shown that Shamrock could pin Michaels. Steve Austin came out for a promo. The announcers were Jim Ross and Jim Cornette. Austin was in constant motion cutting this promo, going in and out of the ring, walking across the announce desk for no reason. It's got a lot of energy. Called out the Rock. I know, I can't imagine why. Called out the Rock and anyone else who wanted to come fight. So the entire nation came out. Rock went to the back. The other three dudes went down to get Austin, who was appalled by this flagrant cowardice. D'Lo Brown hit the ring. Austin whipped his ass. But then Rocky zoomed in out of nowhere and stole the Intercontinental belt. That's right. The crowd told Rocky he sucked. The nation left to the back. Austin took Ross's headset and vowed to meet Rock at the airport and take his belt back. Can you imagine? I'm just going to wait till we go to the airport tomorrow and I'll get it there. I don't need it tonight. I'm not going to tag the man here in the building. I'm going to do it someplace where there's armed security. I'm going to go to the airport and try and get it back. It's security! Austin's plan is to get his belt back at security. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, was granted, it? this was pre-9-11. Mm -hmm. This would certainly never fly today. Maybe it would have been 97. I don't I don't remember that far back. They really missed a good vignette with uh, Austin dressed up as a TSA agent. That is true. There was no oh, TSA Can you imagine? I, I, I'm At SeaTac, I, I think it's like this at every airport, where you put your stuff on the conveyor belt and it goes through the x-ray machine. Right. Can you imagine Austin stunning Rock, throwing him on that belt and throwing him through the x-ray? I mean, he'd probably die. Well, that's not safe, but this was WWE in 97, so they would have thrown his ass on that conveyor belt that's and true. sent him right on through that fucking thing. Mark Merrill versus Jerry Lawler. Sable came out, waved at Butterbean, this pissed Merrill off. So the story was Sta Sable, perhaps in the stables, had been kicked in the head by a horse the week before. Mm -hmm. Therefore, she was wearing sunglasses to cover her black eye. Now, this was really interesting because... She did get kicked by a horse, for real. Right. That's why she had a black eye. But she comes out here, and later there's an argument with Mark Merrow, and her sunglasses fall off, and you see that he's arguing with her, and she's got a big-ass black eye. There's a, right. a large, muscular man with taped fists yes. berating a woman with a black eye in the middle of the ring. Yes. Now, <clears throat> when you first see it, and they start explaining that she got kicked by a horse, 
I mean, because it's WWE in 97, your immediate thought is, well, that's bullshit. I was... It's a makeup job. Yeah. We're supposed to think that Meryl beat her, mm -hmm. and their cover story is she got kicked by a horse. Well, later I find out she got kicked by a fucking horse. Not to mention, later on in the program, Jim Cornette actually did address the fact that now the fans don't know that she got kicked by a horse. So what would their assumption be? Yeah. <laughs> you, he knew. Yeah. It was so weird because, like, she really did get kicked by a horse. But nobody gave WWE the benefit of the doubt. Well, they just presumed they're doing a wife-beating storyline. And I they did play it up. Yeah. But this was like the first week. They've been doing this for a while. When you say you gave them the benefit of the doubt, they had to know when we put this woman in the ring and have Mark Merrill yell at her, people will assume it's a wife beating angle. Of course they knew. And they were cool with that. So they put her out there and did it anyway, knowing people would think it was a wife beating angle. So it may as well have been a wife beating, beating angle anyway. Anyway, Jerry Lawler was much more entertaining than Mark Merrill. I know it's alarming to say, but he was great here. They have Mero out there, and he's having a match with Lawler, and Brian Christopher is out there. And what the idea was, was that Mero and Lawler have a match, and Brian Christopher goes after Sable, and Mero gets distracted, and Lawler hits the pile driver, and Sable runs in and breaks it up, right? Right. Am I, I missing anything? Sure. Did this have to go 25 minutes? No. It went five minutes. It Brian. just kept going. Dude, Brian Christopher's out there harassing Sable for at least 10 minutes. I don't care about whatever the official time is. They're out there forever. Anyway, yes. Sable uh, attacked Lawler for the DQ. Mero hit a nut shot and TKO on Lawler. Then started yelling at Sable. And then we got what we just talked about with the yelling and stuff. This could have all been done in a quarter of the time. I love that the Or guy... left off the show. <laughs> or that. I love the guy with the boxer gimmick has worse punches than Jerry the King Lawler. Yes. Well, Lawler was a... Good puncher. You don't say. Listen, if you want to talk about things that should be left off the show, I mean, later on, when they had that Vince segment. Two of them. Yeah, there were two Vince segments. I think it was after the first one. They came back. Oh, it's Los Bariquas versus Billy Gunn and the Road Dog. Right. There was no reason to put that on the show. No. None. No. Like, no reason. Yeah. There was about a half dozen matches on this show that shouldn't have been on the show. You could argue that, but you can't argue this one. No. And don't even tell me that one went five minutes. Okay, the first official WWF Attitude promo, which was not about profanity or nudity or lewd comments or racist comments as we've seen. No. WWF Attitude was about getting hurt and wrestling anyway. Right. So don't try this at home. That is how WWF Attitude started. They showed clips from Survivor Series with a voiceover from Brett saying he had given notice to WWF and was taking offers from both the WWF and WCW. I assume this is from an angle they did the year before where he had made his return after WrestleMania and said he'd That's right. offers. Yeah. So they showed him trashing monitors after the match and then it was time for Vin Jim Ross and Vince McMahon and why, Brett, why? It was described as an investigative piece with the truth, the truth about the Montreal screw job. Why, Brett, why the untold story? Well, the story is, as Vincent Mann said in almost these words, wrestling is fake, and Brett refused to lay down and forgot it was fake. Ross wanted to know if Vince felt that he had screwed Brett. And Vince said, people will say that, but from my standpoint, Brett screwed Brett. And Vince, by the way, big-ass black eye. Oh, yeah. Which is a key to all of this. And he says, I've made more good decisions and bad decisions. Arguable, by the way, especially nowadays. Talked about the time-honored tradition. Oh, yeah. That when a person is leaving, they show the proper respect to their opponent and the business. And he didn't say what that entailed. No. But he said that Brett didn't do it. Mm -hmm. Now, first off, I don't want to sit here and beat Dave. If you want to read the whole thing, there's two observers covering this whole thing. But first off, this time honored tradition that people always leave and do the right thing on the way out, that's horseshit, okay? Sometimes that happened. Usually they just walked out, especially in the 90s. Mm -hmm. One fucking guy did it on this show. 
and ended up on Nitro at the same time. Rick Rude. Second off, the whole crux of all of this, and this is the reason that when Vince is talking about giving Brett a free shot, like Brett punched him, he gave him a free shot, and if they'd gone head up, maybe things might have been different. 52-year-old Vince McMahon trying to convince me of this. That pissed me off so much. Bret Hart that beat the shit out of Shawn Michaels, an actual wrestler in shape who was in his physical prime, uh -huh. and Vince is going to beat up Bret Hart. <coughs> Ross goes, have you thought about filing a lawsuit? And Vince says, I haven't thought about it. I guess I could. The ball is in Bret's court. And I thought the crux of all of this, and the reason you can't file a lawsuit is because you gave this guy a contract that gave the guy reasonable creative control. And as we talked about on this show, there were a thousand opportunities for Brett to do the job on the way out. He could have done it to Ken Shamrock. Then that one show that we ranted about about two weeks ago. He could have done it before Montreal. He could have done it after Montreal. Montreal was not his last day. He had weeks left. Yeah. So Vince's whole story, it's bullshit. And all I wondered when I watched this was, does this man believe his own bullshit? That's the key question in all of this. Does Vince believe his own bullshit? I would imagine so. Yeah, probably. I mean, I guess he does. But it was just like... It's a great question. You know what it is? This story is the same story of the WWF and the World Wildlife Fund. It's the story of Vince's life. The short version of the World Wildlife Fund was that Vince signed a contract saying, I will only refer to our promotion as World Wrestling Federation. I will never use the letters WWF. And then he proceeded to just ignore the whole thing that he signed. He reneged on his own fucking contract mm -hmm. and ended up losing his ass. Same thing with this. In Vince's mind, I signed you to a contract and you need to uphold your end, but I don't need to uphold mine. That's the story of Vince's life and that's the story of Montreal. Vince yeah. was something else here. When you bring up the Wildlife Fund, you have real-life court of law evidence that, yes, he does, in fact, believe his own bullshit. So there you go. Uh, I, uh, when this is done, I do not time it. I don't know how long it went, but I looked down and I saw this show was a half hour old. Hey, it was compelling TV. I can't say it was bad. It was amazing to see humbled, quiet, contemplative Vince McMahon. You thought this was humbled? <laughs> For Vince! <laughs> The bad portion of the show started in the next segment, actually. Well, here's Miguel Perez and Savio Vega versus Road Dog and Billy Gunn. The outlaws came out wearing the Bariquas gear and mocking their accents. They brawled. The other two Bar Bariquas showed up for the DQ. They all left. The show is still a half hour old. I swear that went less than a minute. That was less than a minute too long. <laughs> You're, I'm not arguing with that. Can Shamrock hype video, including a thousand shots of him taking Brett down at WrestleMania. It was so funny watching this because Vince is sitting there talking about how Brett wouldn't do the time honor tradition. And then 10 minutes later, they show all of this footage of Brett Hart tapping to Ken Shamrock in a bunch of matches where he could have lost a title, but they didn't do it. I'm like, I have no sympathy for you, geek. Ken Shamrock in these clips was swole. You don't bit. say. Mm-hmm. And I will never forget when I read his book. And he was so anti-steroid. Well, of course. Only cowards take steroids. Well, it's all about hard work in the gym. And I could say this now because he's failed steroid tests. It's public. <laughs> but it was funny. I was going to say he gets mad when other people do steroids because that's less steroids that he gets to take. Oh, Vinny. All accusations. Not true. El Torito and Tarantula and Battalion... Versus Max Mini and Mini Nova, and I believe Mini Taurus. You know, I'm glad right. you wrote those down, because there were no graphics. No. You could barely hear the ring announcer. Right. I didn't even bother. I did recognize Battalion, because it's a fucking great name. <laughs> it is a great name. One short man yes. is a fucking battalion. Well, the one well, man battalion. Short and wide and dressed up in camo. Dude, sure. he looked like you, Craig, if you were four and a half feet tall. <laughs> Thank battalion. you. Battalion. <laughs> hey, it's, that, that was praise. So these six dudes are doing some fat-ass lucha. Especially a, Battalion. Of all the... Yeah, Battalion and... Who's the bull? El Torito. They, they, Torito? They, they, they had Torito and Mini Taurus in the ring. For Mini a, Taurus. That was another for one. For a bull versus bull show-off. Or, Fuck, or showdown. Great. It was great lucha, too. Of all the... They brought in the minis before, and they brought in Aguila and... Uh, 
who else did he use? Like Pantera was on the show. <laughs> anyway, this is like the best lucha they've actually had on Raw. And it was all to set up Kane. Hey, you know what's funny about it, though? They had minis, and they also had the cruiserweights, or the light heavyweights. Sure. And if you watch the cruiserweights on Raw, they're all sequestered into their own little locker room, and they're all little fellas. And God bless Noam Dar. Listen, I'm a short guy, too, but he looks like a fucking hobbit. He's so short, and he's got the short, like, limbs. He looks shorter than he really is. Right. And they're all in there, like in a hobbit hole. And they're all sequestered away, and they go out there and they do their matches, and Vince clearly does not take any of this seriously. And it was the same thing with these minis. Like, they didn't even get graphics. Their role was to go out there and do flips. And that was it! We weren't supposed to care about who they were, or their personalities, or anything. No. But you know what's funny? The minis were what the light heavyweights should have been. The light heavyweights came out, and they're just small heavyweights doing small heavyweight matches. You're Boring as fuck. 97 Raw. Yeah. Okay. So they're doing this stuff, and we get comedy with Sunny leapfrogging minis. She throws out her hands and yells, stop. They throw on the brakes, and the lights go out, and Kane appears. And he's going to kill six six men. And the headbanger short to make the save. They break the boombox over Kane's head, but he no-sold it and killed them both. The, they shattered the boombox on his head, and you can see debris flying into the crowd, and crowd fans putting up their hands trying to block the debris as it <laughs> flies into the audience. I was better in that day that Brock threw that fucking guardrail. Oh, Remember that? The car door. The car door. Gee, many Christmas. I love that the headbangers saw these minis getting beaten up and were just like, we gotta do something. Can't st get that boombox. I can't stand for this. Let's go. I can't stand for them beating a battalion. <laughs> DX came out for a promo. Now, watching this at the time, I did not realize which event of the Monday Night Wars occurred in these shows. But I, I knew Rick Rude's time was coming. This was his last appearance in, on Raw. Mm -hmm. And the best job they had done integrating him into the DX entrance. For the first time since he showed up in that suit with that briefcase, he actually felt like he was part of the act. It was his last day. By the way, did they do commentary live after they yes. taped the show? Yes. So that's why Cornette got in the line. Man, that guy gets around. Yes. I see. He was on Nitro mm -hmm. at the same time, and this was a taped show mm -hmm. that they went to the studio and did live commentary for. In case there was anything that they needed to update, any pop culture references or anything. Like of one of their sort. performers appearing on a different television channel. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well. You know what, though? I have no sympathy. If you don't have a fucking guy under contract, and you just put his ass on television every week... Oh, of course. You get what yeah. you deserve. Yeah, Especially during a fucking war. That's what it. did you think was going to happen, you idiots? Yes. No, I totally agree. Anyway, Sean made it clear Ken Shamrock had not beaten him last week. Again, took credit for running Bret Hart out of the company, beating up his entire family. So now it's time to start beating up Bret's friends, starting with Shamrock. At this point, a fan held up a sign reading, Sean Michaels, you have a small dick. Wow. That's not very nice. Hunter called out Slaughter. That's ironic, too, given this segment. Slaughter came out. Hunter buried him, made some dick jokes, threatened to fuck his wife. So, what are you laughing for, Craig? That's exactly what happened. <laughs> that's not what he said, but... It's yeah, not, it was. Not the, he, he didn't not use those words, but that's flat out word. what he said. Just, he any, said, your cock's too small, and when right. I get a hold of your wife... Yeah. We're going to make love. That's not what he said, either. So Sarge decked him, they kicked his ass, they tore his shirt off, they pedigreed him, and then they covered him with toilet paper. Right. What? Well, that's what juveniles do, Vince. I guess. They TP'd him. I see. They made an X out Can of Can you TP. imagine how cool they were in 1997? <laughs> and we look back today <laughs> like old men. I had no idea what was happening. They fucking TP'd a man. Right. <laughs> it's so stupid. And you know what? As soon as Sarge came out and Hunter got in his face, I suddenly remembered this fucking boot camp match. Oh, yeah. I'd totally forgotten. What a horrible time in wrestling this was. <laughs> it's so fondly in, remembered, and it was so goddamn in, horrible. In WWF especially. The visual of Slaughter's chin and Triple H's nose. You it, know what I loved also? It, it was speaking hysterical. of the chin, like, there's chin jokes everywhere. Right. Like, they make fun of you if you have no chin. Yeah. And they make fun of you if your chin's too big. Of right. course. This is wrestling. Dude, we saw you saw on the show they're making jokes about the 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 minis, the short the 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 short fellows from Mexico. Then you turn to night show, they make fun of the giant for being too big. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you something. 
I give WWE full p- permission to steal another one of my ideas. They need to do a segment on Survivor Series where James Ellsworth runs into Sergeant Slaughter. And they go chin to no chin. I see. They just fit together like a puzzle. There was a point where Sarge and Hunter were going face to face. And I'm looking at Sarge's profile and... Be- because he has a small nose and a big chin, from like the point of his chin to the point of his forehead is like a straight line. It's just, just a flat face, totally. Scott Taylor versus Eric Shelley. Oh, boy. That would be Scotty too hotty. You know what was amazing about this match? First off, they did a million moves. The phone call. And they just kept wrestling forever. We'll get to the phone call. But they do moves and 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 moves. And then finally, there's a winner. I think it was Scotty. Scotty yes. won. I fell asleep, so I'm not sure. But what was ironic about it is plain old generic Scott Taylor doing 9 million moves. And then you realize this guy became Scotty Too Hotty mm-hmm. and became a million times more popular. And he had one move. Right. And it was a stupid move. Like, he had no other moves when he was Scotty Too Hotty. I couldn't even believe I was looking at the same guy. Yeah. This match... They went a million miles an hour. They did a million moves, and nobody cared. There no! Was, there was no story to it. There was no flow. There was no comeback. There was no heat. There was no crowd interaction. There was no reason for the crowd to care about this at all whatsoever. The well, crowd- you know why? Because if you watch a lot of Scotty Too Hotty matches, it's not like he just stopped doing all those moves. I think it was more that they took two guys for a light heavyweight tournament, and they said, go out there and, like, can you do some flips? Or can you fly around a little bit? You could see that neither man was a luchador. To put it mildly, this Eric Shelley tried to do the thing where someone gets your arm and you grab their rope and you do a backflip like, out of it. Oh yeah. And like he was in fucking slow motion and Scotty's trying to help turn this guy over, but they had to do some flips because they're little guys. And then Jeff called. Jeff Jarrett called in on the telephone while this match was going on and we heard Jeff talking during the entire match. He was upset they had not promoted his major announcement. Instead, they devoted an entire show to talking about Bret Hart after he had left the company. He's got a point there, I have to admit. So here's his announcement. He's going to wrestle next week. Mm -hmm. Dude. Wow. I can't wait for that. So I was watching this match, and I wrote, I have never seen a match that had as little heat as this ever. Now, there was, like, background chatter. Oh, dude. The New Day tag match on last week's Raw, there's no way that this was more dead than that well, one. Well, listen, listen closely to it. There was, like, background chatter, like at a baseball game. Mm-hmm. Well, that's better than that New Day match. It occurred to me this was piped in. They are piping in background chatter. Not cheers or boos. Just a soft, low hum. Taylor used an angle slam and won with the diving DDT, and this failed. Marrow and Sable came out for a promo. He said this was his woman, his property, and she was being stalked by Butterbean. And the WWF wasn't doing anything about it. He called out Butterbean, who got in the ring. Marrow threatened him, called him a fat ass, and shoved him. Can we talk about the Zubaz? I mean, is there anything else to talk about? Have at it. You want to know what? I give the WWE credit. They actually took Butterbean, moved him to a different part of the arena, and changed out that hideous sweater from the week before in our number four of their taping their continuity was awesome because it was very very important we are digging deep to find compliments <laughs> from 1997 raw that's all i'm I not i'm not mad at you i'm not making fun of you <laughs> let's talk about this zoo bad <laughs> i mean they even brought attention to it like i mean they got rid of his sweater to put on zoo bad's pants i mean is that really an upgrade well you don't put never mind they probably said bean bring a couple <laughs> of changes of clothes and he showed up with a Cosby sweater, and Zubaz. Well, anyway, he was called a fat ass, which was not entirely inaccurate. <laughs> and then he shoved the dude down, and geeks broke it up. Yeah. I don't know what more to say. Why, Brett, why part two? God, this was the amazing one. Vince said, Ross asked, will Brett ever work with you again? And Vince says, this is a strange business. That's for fucking sure. And that right. was the understatement of the decade. He is right there, but he says, Brett and I may be able to work together if, if, first, Brett must apologize. And second, Brett has to know 
there will be no more free shots. Yeah, this asshole. <laughs> yes, tough guy. He's a shooter, Vinny. He's Vince McMahon. A shooter. This man tore his pecs walking to the ring. Or tore his uh, quads walking to the ring. Well, you know what he did? It wasn't even that he tore... It was Nash that tore his quads walking. Mm -hmm. It was Vince who was so clumsy that when he tried to slide into the ring... Right. He mistimed it and rammed both of his legs into the apron. The hardest part of the fucking ring. Maybe that's why they say that <laughs> That's what they should have known. That's right. the only way that Vince could have tore his quads. He had the hardest part of the ring. And that's how he tore his quads. You know, if I'd never seen Vince McMahon wrestle, maybe I could create the fantasy in my head that he was a tough guy. But I saw this guy. Uh -huh. He was so clumsy and so stiff. I mean, give me a break. Oh, why are we even talking about whether Vince could beat up Bret Hart? This is stupid. Now, he did say one thing that was totally correct. He said, I believe that Bret Hart made a mistake that he will regret from a professional standpoint. And that's for fucking sure. Because he was used so badly in WCW. Yeah. You could not have used a guy worse. He also said one other th true thing, I will say. He said, yes, Bret sold out, and it's not a big deal because I helped him do it. Right. Now... He is still taking credit for it there. But yes, it's not a big deal that Brett took a better offer to do his job. Anyway, he was sure to point out. I always out, hated those stupid you sold out chants. They are stupid. Like mm -hmm. one of those fans would not have said, you know what? I've been offered double the money for a better job. But you know what? I'm just going to stay here. No one would do that. Yeah. Everybody works to get a raise. So the closing line here was, I actually, first, Vince, he never apologized, but he said he had regrets, including upsetting the fans and Brett's family. But his closing line was, he was upset that a 14-year relationship had ended because one of them forgot they were in the sports entertainment business. You know, it's fake! Mm -hmm. That was the thing that just drove me nuts about this whole thing. This was like the beginning of the end for this business. He had a chance to live up to that in his last match, and he failed. He wouldn't do the job. Yeah. I love when I make a comment like that and somebody gets mad at me and they go, Brian, he never said he wouldn't do the job. I know he didn't use those words, you fuckers, but that's what he said in this promo. It was patently obvious, unless you're an idiot. Vader versus Goldust. Oh, boy. Goldust came out with checkerboard face paint and his arm in a sling. Pleaded he had a broken arm and had not been cleared to wrestle. Yet he still flew to the building put on his wacky costume, put on his makeup, and walked down to the ring. The man was wearing pantyhose and an oversized button-up shirt. Yes. And slippers. What's wrong with that? Not something I'd go out in. Don't judge gold dust attire. So, Vader and he Gerald... He wasn't wearing Zubaz. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you got me there, Brian. Vader and Gerald Briscoe began to look over the doctor's note when Goldust pulled a hammer out of his sling and waffled <laughs> Vader with it. <laughs> Fucking Gerald Briscoe is going to determine whether this doctor's note is legitimate or not. <laughs> you know, he's a handwriting expert. He's going to determine whether there's a real doctor's note. Gerald Briscoe. And Goldust left, and that was that. And Vader goes, fuck, right in the mic. <laughs> Sergeant Slaughter came out. He said he was commissioner. The background chatter is being piped in again. He said, fans have booed me and fans have cheered me. In this segment, I can confirm they were doing neither. He booked himself against Triple H for the DX pay-per-view. This took too long and got little reaction. Rocky Maivia versus Dude Love. Rock cut a promo with Austin's icy belt over his shoulder, said this would not be a title match. The announcers were still getting used to calling him The Rock. You know what Jim Cornette was really good at? A lot. Not Jim Cornette, Jim Ross. Also, I mean, they were both good at a lot. Also but a lot, but yeah. Jim Ross was so good at believably expressing disgust at the heels. Like, the commentators try to do it nowadays, but they all come off so phony. And when Rock is in there going, this match tonight will not be for my Intercontinental title... Jim Ross, with such disgust, just goes, You're, he's not the champion. I, I can't even do it as good as Ross. I can't even come close. No. Ross was so good at being disgusted by these heels. So you mentioned this was not a live show. <laughs> you can tell because there is a point where The Rock begins to do what is now known as the People's Elbow. Mm -hmm. And they go to commercial during the move. 
<laughs> and when they came back, he finished the people's elbows, right? <laughs> well, you know, that's believable. I like to think that for five minutes, he was just running the rope slowly back and forth. Uh, let's see. Not one of their classics. Now, dude hit sweet shit music in the double arm DDT and the nation attacked for the DQ. This is Nitro. Aust- no, Nitro was way worse. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Dude, uh, they, they had one big run-in at the end. It's not like in every single match. I, I mean, okay, how many this, run-ins okay. were there on Nitro? Like 15. That's fair. That's fair. Anyway, Austin ran out. Rocky fled. Austin and Dude cleared the ring. D'Lo got stunned, and that was that. Rocky from 1997 October to Rocky 1997 November has improved by leaps and bounds. Dude, it wasn't even that. Rock from three weeks ago. Well, that was three weeks ago, Brian, but Oh, they meant the year before. <laughs> Did he say 96 to 97? Am I out of my mind? No, I, I said don't. Couldn't you just said three damn weeks? So we don't have to do adding. Math. math or subtracting. Comparison numbers. Dates. Rock's a lot better in the last three weeks. Turn yes. it around. Thank you. Greater than when you're doing it when the... Out Which way does the damn Pac-Man face? The, yes. <laughs> goes towards the larger number. What's this thing called? A bracket? A T? That's a timeout sign. No, yeah. you idiot. Then the computer, the carrot, but it's sideways. Oh. What's that called? Divide? You greater, don't even know either? It's the greater than, less than symbol. They call it something. It's not the bracket, because the bracket is the bracket. The bracket's a square one. Yeah. So what's that called? God damn it, I don't know, and now it's bothering me. Uh, see? You were making fun of me, and you don't know. You don't know either. I'm going to Google it. All right, let's get going here. You're leading the show, Craig. I'm so excited. You're so good at it. Oh, yeah. It's my favorite thing to Craig, do. Craig, think about this. When Vinny started, he was no good at it. I just made him keep doing it, and eventually right. he became competent. Right. So go, and then in 2026, you'll be good at it. <laughs> Trial by fire, baby. Hopefully I'll have something else to do with my time by 2026. I'll jump in there. Dude, it's an hour a week. You'll be fine. You'll be doing this really, in 2036. Just an hour, you say? Well, maybe you'll move. Okay. I don't know. All right, Monday Night Raw, November 24th. Oh, by the way, before we get into it, mm-hmm. since you're here. Right. I already Facebooked Michelle personally. Right. To tell her how much I missed her cookies. Yeah, that uh, that's a disturbing text as a husband to get from one of your buddies. What are you talking about? Hey, I didn't. That's why I didn't send it to you. I missed your. Hey, cookies. Michelle, how I missed your cookies. I sent it to her personally. I know. With an emoji. I know. Anyway, <laughs> this fucker Rodney. <laughs> how dare you? He brings back this giant. He brings back two plates of cookies. Right. And I was trying so hard to keep both plates. No. And he wouldn't allow it. No, one of those plates was for Vince and his dear wife. I know, but his dear wife, who is a dear, sweet woman, right. who also makes cookies for me. Right. First off, Vinny doesn't need any more cookies. By the way, what's in that container right over there? Uh, it needs to be thrown out, is what it is. Those are cookies, Brian. But you didn't finish them. The point of this is, Vinny doesn't need any more cookies. Correct. And Bridget makes a lot of cookies anyway. Sure. And Bridget just underwent surgery. I'm not sure if she can even have cookies. Of course she can. So I felt that it was cruel... Mm-hmm. For Rodney to bring the cookies over to Vinny and Bridget, I tried very hard to keep them here. My but he, wife, he wouldn't allow it. My wife makes a bunch of cookies. I try to get them out of the house, Brian. Well, why the hell don't you ever bring them here? Because she doesn't make them very often. But when she does, I want them out of the house. Dude, I'm sending her another Facebook message. Is that right? He ain't gonna get an emoji this time. She's gonna get the full money. Excuse me? A photograph. What? Yeah, you'll see. I'm gonna start sending her baby pictures. If... <laughs> In exchange There's for There's a joke in there somewhere, and I'm cookies. not sure I should make it. Let's go, Craig. But they're good cookies. Let her know that. I know she doesn't listen to this show. Right. God forbid. All right. Monday Night Raw, November 24th, 1997. It's from Fayetteville, North Carolina. We get Rick Rude's theme music. First thing on the show. As you remember, last week, we talked about how Rick Rude was not, in fact, in the WWE anymore. WWF at the time. Down to the ring struts Harvey Whippleman. What a coincidence. In a cheap suit. He gets in the ring, introduces DX. Sean and Hunter and China stroll down to the ring. Sean gets in the ring. Pie faces Harvey Whippleman. 
pushes him out of the ring and says, and I quote, well, that was a tough spot to fill. Man, what a burial of Rick Rude. What did the guy ever do to deserve that? Sean goes on to say he hasn't gotten a lot of sleep since Survivor Series. He's been a total wreck since the whole Montreal screw job. He says, even though uh, he even actually starts to fake cry. He says, uh, everybody deserved a better outcome than what we got. He says, without the knowledge of Vince or anybody else in the WWE, Sean had contacted Brett and said he wanted to confront him here tonight. He says, whether that confrontation ends in a handshake or a fight, it'll end once and for all tonight. Man. Hunter and China looked shocked. Mm -hmm. Couldn't believe it. The announcers fell for it. Sean said his God, Craig, was his witness. That's right. Brett would be here tonight. It's okay for the heels to lie, Brian. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Wow. Well, this was obviously before he found God, because that was a blatant lie. It's true. Next up, we had the Legion of Doom versus Road Dog and Billy Gunn for the tag team titles. Road Dog and Billy Gunn came out in uh, the Warriors shoulder pads. Can we talk about this damn match? Go ahead. What a... If I have to see... And I don't know how long the Legion of Doom remains in WWF, but... I could go the rest of my life without having to see Hawk as the babyface in peril. Is there a worse babyface in peril in the history of wrestling? Yes, but Animal's comeback is so great. I guess... But having to sit through Hawk selling as a babyface in peril for 15 minutes before Animal finally makes the tag. Oh, my lord. It was bad. And this, if I recall correctly, Hawk's starting to have some problems. So you can imagine. You can imagine how things are escalating here with him having issues and playing babyface in peril. So the Road Dog and Billy Gunn, Enzo and Cass 19 years ago. There's a ref bump. I will give the ref credit. Animal went for a shoulder block and wiped out the referee. That was great. Mm -hmm. They double team Billy. They go for the doomsday device. Road Dog gets a chair shot to Animal's back. Billy does the sweetest victory roll you've ever seen. Yeah. Never seen him look so athletic. And a second referee runs down and counts the pin. Got Billy and Road Dog, the new tag team champions. They pulled an Earl Hebner, and they fled to a getaway car, and they got the hell out of Montreal. That's right. In here also, JR was sure to point out that the ECW November to Remember would be coming up on November 30th, and uh, Jim Cornette exclaimed that, oddly enough, he had a colostomy, or excuse me, a colonoscopy <laughs> scheduled for that exact day, so he's going to get to miss it. Man. Next out, we have Goldust in a wheelchair. There is a nurse pushing him. Dude, I know this sounds terrible, but when Goldust comes out in the wheelchair, I didn't know who it was. <laughs> and I swear to God, I'm like, who's the man? Yeah. Is it a random guy that they had backstage? Like, is it Flash Flanagan? Like, except the physique wasn't good enough. Flash is a little bit too skinny. I'm like, who is this guy? Turns out it's Luna Vachon. Yeah, that's not a guy. Man, oh man. She was jacked. I remember last week when I was talking about how Jim Ross was so great at just being disgusted by the heels. They do this deal, and Goldust talks about he's an invalid. Yes, his, his broken arm has spread to the rest of his body. Is what he stated. And now he's a paraplegic. Mm -hmm. But then he goes, I woke up, I couldn't move anything, so I'm a quadriplegic. Right. Now, I don't know. That's that's four. I have a buddy, I have a guy in my jiu-jitsu class who is in fact a paraplegic. Like he has no usage of his legs. Wow. Goes in there, trains his ass off. Like, when the school had the fire and we had to go back to the other building, we had to train upstairs. It was like, we had to set up mats downstairs because he couldn't get up the stairs. And then, 
because everyone else trained upstairs and people would go downstairs to train with him and then they have to go back upstairs and switch. He was finally like, this, this is bullshit. And so he would, he dragged himself up the stairs to train with everybody else upstairs, he would drag himself back downstairs. This dude's awesome. And now here's WWE doing some stupid storyline where Goldust is in a wheelchair talking about how he's a par he's joking about being a paraplegic and a quadriplegic. I was like, this is horse shit. This sucks. And of course, Vader comes down and the nurse throws alcohol in his eyes and they stomp a mud hole in him. My whole point to all of this is when the nurse rips off the smock and it's Luna, Jim Ross is so awesome mm -hmm. screaming, what is that? Not who is that? What the hell is that? He says. And he ends by saying, he left his wife for that? You know, he's right, but when you look at gold dust, yeah. In fact, he did. <laughs> and I find that more believable than a lot of other stuff I see in wrestling nowadays. Next up, we have Sergeant Slaughter coming down to the ring. He cut a 1980s uh, fiery babyface promo and um, challenged Hunter Hearst Helmsley for the next pay-per-view. Didn't challenge him. He changed the match to a boot camp match called him a maggot and such i said maggot thank you craig yeah i just want to make sure not a fair i don't care what anybody says i thought this was so awesome it was great he comes out as his usual marble mouth self and he says it's not the attack on me that caused this match between the two of us because i'm i'm just fine but it was when you made comments about my family now we're going to have this boot camp match. And he says, it's not Commissioner Slaughter you'll be facing. It's Sergeant Slaughter. Mm -hmm. And he cuts this classic Sergeant Slaughter promo that's like half hokey, but all awesome. In 1997, Dave mocked this in The Observer. Really? Yeah, because it was like he cut a promo from 1983 right. in 1997. Now, Fair. I'm sure when Dave wrote this, he was absolutely right. But we now live in a world where nobody can cut a believable promo. And so now I look back at Sergeant Slaughter's promo, and I'm like, that's a fucking great promo that guy cut right there. Now, with that said, among his lines were, he wanted to know if Hunter had ever felt the cold steel of a bayonet in his guts. I'm guessing no. Yeah, my guess would be no. And also, he celebrated killing men with his bare hands. Hmm. And he suggested that he might kill Triple H in this boot camp match. Now, if I recall this boot camp match, he didn't kill Hunter, but he goddamn near killed me. That yep. match was horrible. I remember it being kind of fun. I'll have to watch it again. Well, I don't have fond memories. But I probably didn't have fond memories of this promo until I watched it again. Very true. Next up, we had the WWF Lightweight Title Tournament Quarterfinals. Brian Christopher, with his dad at his side, versus Flash Flanagan. This was probably, in my opinion, the best match in this tournament. It was very basic, very simple. Went just under three, or excuse me, just under four minutes. I thought it sucked. Really? Yeah. Wow. I thought that Flash Flanagan was pretty much horrible. He was not at his best. I saw no Flash in Flash Flanagan. Wow. Yeah. He was flat Flanagan. I guess is about the nicest thing I could say. Well, this tournament isn't setting anything on fire by any stretch of the imagination, but I thought this match was pretty decent. Well, that was terrible. They, I did like Brian Christopher playing the entire Midnight Express by himself. <laughs> in Alabama Jam. He did a skull-crushing finale. And... After he won, it was announced that it is Agula versus Taka on one side. And yes, it is Brian Christopher versus Scotty Tuhati on the other side of the bracket. Did you notice that uh, Brian Christopher used the skull crushing finale in this match? I just said that like Did you? 10 seconds ago. I'm sorry. I'm reading my notes trying to keep up. They uh, The very first move of the match is Flanagan hits a... Uh, a flip dive to the outside, but they were too busy showing the brackets on the screen and they completely missed the first move of the match. Probably for the best. 
saying what I saw out of Flash Flanagan here. Flash Flanagan ended up really good. He was not really good in this match. And how annoying is Brian Christopher's giggle? That That's cackle. the gimmick. My goodness. You're supposed to hate it. I understand that, but there is overkill. No? Just me. It was a three-minute match, dude. If he did that for 25 minutes, we'd probably be on the same page. <laughs> uh, just then, a uh, white limo arrived. We haven't seen this in a while. How many limos pulling up and then all the speculation throughout the end of the show, whether it's this show or Nitro? DX returned to the ring. Have a final showdown with Brett. Before it begins, Hunter Hearst Townsley tells Sergeant Slaughter that he wasn't scared of him. He wasn't scared of him when he was a kid, and he's not scared of him now. Hunter tells Fayetteville that he'll be banging all the wives of all the soldiers that are gone. Hmm. In not so many words. Their Fort Bragg is near, apparently. Sean introduces Bret Hart. And this, of course, is the classic um, skit where the uh, little person, Bret Hart, comes to the ring. Dwarf. Dwarf? No. Is that the technical term, Brent? Yes, it is. But it's wrestling. We can actually call them midgets, correct? I mean, they do. I know they do. We can. I guess we just did. Anyway, the little person comes down to the ring. He's got a Bret Hart mask on. He's got a leather jacket, no shirt, jeans. He gets into the ring. Um, I've lost my notes again. I'm sorry. They make a bunch of short jokes. Yes, they do. You make should be able to remember that without your notes. He does make a bunch of short jokes. Sean, talk about how he's small and he's short. Sean puts him in a sharpshooter. And Helms then, <laughs> let me let me let me take over for you, Craig. Sean puts him in a sharpshooter. Bread taps. Hunter recaps Survivor Series, the Thank finish, you. and then they slap a WCW tag on his ass and they toss him out of the ring. Now, you notice that they put a WCW tag on his ass? Right. So, we've got, on Nitro, everybody's bearing WCW, w. and on Raw, everybody's bearing WCW. That's true. And you wonder why WCW ended up going out of business. They're making fun of the company... And the company's making fun of themselves. It's a bad combination. So then, we get the best part of the show. And by best, I mean the worst. Yeah. So Bret Hart gets fucked in Montreal. He's screwed by his longtime employer. He's sent packing. He's humiliated in his home country. So out comes Jim Neidhart, his brother-in-law, longtime member of the Hart Foundation. He says, you DX, you're degenerates. I'm married to a heart. I'm going to take this opportunity to go down there right now and kick your butts. I did that much better than Jim Neidhart, I might add. <laughs> he was horrible. God bless him. So then, Sean cuts a promo. And he basically turns Anvil on his own head. He says, Anvil, where the hell are the rest of the hearts? Where's the bulldog? Where's Owen? Did you get any of that money that Bret Hart made to sell out? He said bulldog was at home nursing an injury. And Sean says, yeah, I know all about that. Wink, wink, knee injury. The old phony knee injury. I know that one well, Jim. Offers him a spot in DX. Says the offer expires at 11 p.m. tonight. And granted, before the show was even over, in the middle of this segment, I wrote these words. Boy, did they make Anvil come off as a numbskull simpleton. That was before the main event. Yeah, anybody could see this coming. This this was not <laughs> this was not a wink wink thing anybody could see this what was going to happen can you imagine i mean let's just imagine this for a second 
Bret Hart gets fucked in Montreal. His brother Owen is trying to get out of his contract, wants to get out of his contract. Bulldog is trying to get out of his contract, wants to get out of his contract. Bulldog actually does! He pays like $100,000, if I recall correctly, to get out of that damn contract and go to WCW. Yeah. Meanwhile, Jim Neidhart happily comes out on television to look like the biggest dumb shit. I couldn't even believe this. And I remember it! There's so much stuff that I remember, but when I actually see it, I can't even believe my eyes. How in the world did he go along with this? Got me. Next up, we had Ken Shamrock versus Savio Vega. This. You didn't like this? Craig. It was short. I mean, it was... No, that's the point. It was five minutes long. Yeah. All right. Ken Shamrock on December 8th is getting a shot at the WWE World Heavyweight title against Shawn Michaels. Right. He goes five minutes and sells for Savio Vega. It's true. He should have killed this dude. This would have been fine in a vacuum. But, like, on a show where they're trying to build up a challenger for Shawn Michaels, sending out Ken Shamrock to sell for Savio Vega, that was death. So, Savio jumps Ken at the bell. Shamrock fights back and hits an, gets an ankle lock very early in the match. He runs into a spinning heel kick in the corner. Savio dumps Shamrock, and Miguel Perez Jr. runs down and starts putting the boots to him. Savio has the offense briefly, but goes for a big splash. Shamrock gets his knees up, makes a comeback with a power slam and a hurricane rana. Miguel gets knocked off the apron, and Shamrock ducks another spin wheel kick, hits a belly-to-belly -belly suplex, and the ankle lock for the tap out. Thank God he tapped the guy out. Thank God this wasn't a disqualification. Could have been worse. Could have been. But only barely. Next up, we have the Nation of Domination out in the ring. Now, this was great. This was actually great. Rocky Maivia What a shocker. The Rock and Steve Austin were involved in an angle that was great. <laughs> right. Rocky immediately takes the mic away from Michael Cole. He's got the IC strap over his shoulder, and, you know, he's not the champ, but he says he's the champ. Somebody starts messing with the lights and the mic. So Rock will be talking, and then all of a sudden, cut, it. so anyway. They show on the big screen the uh, words Rocky sucks over and over and over again. So the crowd starts chanting along. They uh, cut to the back and they show Austin in the quote unquote control room, pushing buttons and telling the uh, the guy running the board what to do. Rock sends the Nation of Domination out to find Austin, see what's going on. We have uh, Stone Cold saying that um, you have to ask yourself a question. The next time you see 316 on your beeper, you remember beepers? Does anybody remember beepers? I could not believe there was a beeper in this segment. It says when you three see 316 on your beeper, you better watch yourself. So next thing you know, oh, he also says, is this live or is this Memorex? That's the question. He Memorex. Memorex. You know, those things you used this to This was the most on. dated segment I've ever seen. It's true. This was not modern. So Rock's looking at the screen, and of course, Stone Cold's behind him. The Rock's beeper goes off. He reaches down, unclips it from his belt, looks at it. His eyes grow wide. Stone Cold spins him around, drops him with a stunner. Love this. This was a great, simple angle. It was a, this was a swerve, but it was a good swerve because it made sense. You thought that you were watching a live clip of Austin in the truck because all of the weird things were happening with the mics and the lights, but it was a swerve. It was a tape and he snuck into the ring and beat the hell out of the rock after texting him on his beeper. The nation of domination ran back down. Hold on a second. Okay. 
I remember I had a beeper in like 12th grade. I had a pager. Okay. And what would happen was you would you had this little box that all the youngsters just can't even believe this. <laughs> you had a little box that clipped to your belt. Uh-huh. And every now and then it would vibrate and you would look down and there was a phone number. Right. So you knew that you had to call somebody. Right. Okay. Now, if I recall correctly, could you also text? Could you also send a message? I have no idea. I seem to vaguely recall that you could send like a very simple message. But anyway, how did you leave a message on the beeper? I don't even remember that. I, you got me. I've never had a beeper. Did they give you like a number and when you and all you did was call the number and then the beeper? Uh, what do you mean you never had a beeper? I never had a beeper. How did you never have a beeper? Because I didn't sell drugs. I didn't either. <laughs> I went to Bothell High. That was the joke. If you had a beeper, you were obviously dealing drugs. No, I had a beeper because I had many important phone calls I had to get when I, I was see. in the 12th grade. But seriously, anybody, somebody alert me on the board because I don't even remember. How did you contact someone with their beeper? Was there a beeper number? And you called it, and you could, like couldn't leave a message, but the beeper would like do a caller ID. How did the beeper work? I must know this. <laughs> I can't believe I don't even remember. Why would you? You have a phone now. It is possible that I had a beeper, but no one ever called it. Uh, and so I just had it for purposes of just being really cool in the 12th grade. Yeah, how'd that work out? Hey, look at me, baby. Again, I ask. So anyway, great angle. So anyway, the nation's domination runs back down to the ring. Austin slides out of the ring to grab a chair, giving Rock enough time to come to his senses and grab the belt so he's still in possession of the belt. This angle. Next up, we had Crush versus Jeff Jarrett. Crush rides down to the ring on his bike. The camera cuts to backstage, and Jeff Jarrett is pitching a fit about the poor locker room condition he's complaining about the food he's complaining about the facilities to dress and he says these don't meet these conditions don't meet the terms of my contract and he refuses to wrestle and by the way he kept calling crush chains yeah, it was weird he kept calling him chains and everybody else was calling him crush well that was crush in the ring I guess Crush and Chains... They're two different people. Who was Crush? What? Crush wasn't Chains. I forget which one was Crush and which one was Chains. I guess this was just Crush. Crush wasn't Chains? Are we sure? Are now, we positive? Now I'm, dating, now I'm doubting See? myself. <laughs> I fucking knew it. Let me find out. Brian, <laughs> Brian is doing some recon. Okay, Brian Adams was... Okay. Crush. Uh-huh. There was Skull. And he wasn't Chains. There was 8-Ball. Yeah, I couldn't tell. I thought maybe Crush was Skull or 8-Ball. There was Skull, 8-Ball, chains. chains, and Crush, right? Yeah. Well, Crush, I know he was, I know Crush was Crush. Yeah. But I didn't know if he was Chains. Yeah, and You know what? At the end of the thing, they, they said the, the man in the ring is Crush. Sure. And, and Jeff Jarrett was calling him Chains the whole time. Honest to God. Honest to God. I chains thought, was Brian Lee. I thought that Crush had been chains but he wasn't chains anymore but uh -huh. since Jarrett had been gone he kept calling him chains when he was now crush but now i'm starting to figure out that in fact crush and chains were two different guys i see and he was talking about the wrong dude right which means why didn't they pre-tape this and if they did why didn't they fix it both valid questions brian so anyway they declare crush the winner Next thing you know, Kane and Paul Bear are strolling out of the ring. Crush is standing up to Kane, but is quickly put down with a choke slam and then a tombstone. The DOA comes out to help their leader, Crush. Gerald Briscoe gets into the ring and takes a pretty good choke slam for a man his age. All right. I've done some research here. <laughs> it's, it's, it's amazing. It is absolutely amazing the things that I vividly remember from the 90s. Right. And the things I absolutely fucking cannot remember for the life of me. Well, it's not important, Brian. That's the key. So the DOA 
consisted of four main members. Crush, we got him. Chains, who was Brian Lee. As stated. Okay. Skull, who I have no memory of. Skull and, and Eight Ball are the Harris twins. Skull and Eight Ball. Oh, that's right. The fucking Harris brothers. Right. I got it. So you had two who long hair. Possibly give a shit. I mean, seriously. <laughs> you had two guys with long hair and Honest two to guys God, who were bald. That's a serious question. Somebody listening to this right now is really pissed off that Brian Alvarez can't remember who was in the DOA. But honest to God, who could care? Yep. I would bet you anything that even Ron and Don Harris nowadays don't give a shit. They may not even remember which one they were. They're trying to run TNA or something right now. Yeah, they got bigger fucking problems that's than right. being skull and eight ball. I'm still trying to figure out how a pager works. <laughs> so then we get the main event. If Shawn Michaels versus Vader. I was very excited to see this as the main event. Remembering their classic match at SummerSlam. The often duplicated. Yeah. They better. did it better. You don't you know, say. You know what's funny about this match here? By the way, Jeff Jarrett's Kurt Hawkins. I want to throw that out there. So, Shawn Michaels didn't really like Vader or working with him. Huh. Which is funny, because they always had good matches. Absolutely. But part of that is, Shawn had good mic matches with everybody. You could not have a bad match with Shawn Michaels. That is also fair. Even when he tried to have a bad match, it was good. Like, he tried to have a bad match with Hulk Hogan. And it was awesome. It was amazing. So. For different reasons. There's two things about this that are notable. One... Even though Sean didn't really like the guy, and even though Sean was admittedly like a total asshole during this period, mm -hmm. and a selfish dickhead, Sean came out here and gave Vader the whole entire match. Well, yeah. <laughs> he gave him everything. It was two minutes and 42 seconds. He came out, and for two minutes and 42 seconds, he sold and 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 sold. Vader got low-bridged outside... And posted by China. Mm -hmm. And then he got back in the ring and Sean sold and sold and sold and sold and sold and sold. That's correct. And finally, Sean's flat on his back directing traffic. He's yelling at China to get her ass on the apron because she's... Yep, out of position. Out of position. She gets up on the apron. The ref is distracted. Hunter throws coffee in Vader's eyes. Vader falls down. Sean super kicks and pins the guy. Yep. And it was just amazing to me that this selfish prick, this admittedly selfish prick, still, even though he didn't really like the guy, he knew there's no point in me killing Vader here. Vader's feuding with Gold Dust, and I'm winning, so fuck, I'll just sell for the guy for 2 minutes and 42 seconds because I'm pinning him in the end. <laughs> I was just, I was blown away watching this match. Yeah. Like... Can you imagine Triple H doing this for anybody at any point in his entire fucking career? Not one match. Can you imagine anybody? Who does this for people nowadays? I mean, if there's a TV match and Seth Rollins is going to lose to... I'm trying to think of what it would be here. If Kevin Owens were going to lose... Or if Kevin Owens... He did! Kevin Owens beat Seth Rollins on Monday. I'll take your word for it. Kevin Owens did not just... Like, or Seth Rollins, I'm trying to, f what the fuck's going on with my brain here? Kevin Owens was winning in the end. Must be something in the end. So did he give Seth Rollins like 100% of the match and then just pin him in the end after some bullshit? Well, of no. course not. They wouldn't even allow that nowadays. But Sean understood that what was best for business, it was to not kill Vader. He was pinning the guy in the end, so he let him have the whole match. Blows my mind. It makes total sense. Of course it does, that's my point. So then Jim gets in the ring with the rest of DX. Got Sean on one side, Hunter on the other. They're raising his hands high in the air. And you can see China lurking in the back. Anyone, anyone could have seen this coming. Of course, China takes a knee and punches him low. And then they stop. She takes a knee? Oh, she, she gets on her knee. Yeah, yes, she kneels, Brian. I thought there was a knee in the ring. She struck him with it. Like maybe gold dust knee was left in the ring and she picked it up and hit the guy with it. Anyway, she low blowed the guy and he Thank could you. not possibly have looked like a bigger geek. I mean, man, let me tell you something. 
I watch Raw and SmackDown, and I think, look at all these geeks. Not one of these geeks has anything on Jim the Anvil Nightheart in this show. He was the geek to end all geeks. He was the guy that began the term geek in pro wrestling. Every geek owes something to Jim Neidhart for his geekiness here on this show. The biggest geek. So they lay a beat down on Jim. Sean gets in the camera and states that DX rules the wrestling world. And Jim Ross is disgusted. Yes, he is. And that was the end of Raw. That was the end of Raw, everybody. It was an Attitude Era Raw. Yeah. If you want to see an Attitude Era Raw, this was a show for you. I was so happy that Vinny returned just in time to see another great Headbangers match on Raw. Mm-hmm. What would they do without me? I don't even know if they were on the show last week. I don't think so. I think they took a week off because you were gone. And now they're back. <laughs> Good planning on their part. Right. They got you in the end. They did. They did. It is amazing that the Headbangers are not appearing on Raw, the show that you watch, but they are appearing on SmackDown, the show that you don't watch. Maybe that'll change. You never know. Maybe they'll get drafted. Are they doing that again? Well, no. If they do, we should cover it this time. And now that I People think about upset. it, now that I think about it, they're not even, they're not even signed, technically. So they could show up on Raw at any time. We can only hope. All right, let's do this show. Okay, then. Vinny's already distracted. To be fair, I'm not going to say I'm not distracted, but I was, what I was, what distracted me was looking forward in my nose to remember what the headbangers did. I don't remember. Okay. I mean, we'll get to well, it. Well, now I know. <laughs> what did they do? Wrestled a match. Well, I know that. Who? The Outlaws. Oh, yeah. Retro Raw, number 236, December 1st, 1997. Show opened with a recap of what happened on the show I missed when uh, the not yet New Age Outlaws, they beat the LOD for the tag titles, ran out of the building into a getaway car, parodying what happened to Shawn Michaels after Survivor Series ended two weeks before. That's right. Was. Hey, speaking of Survivor Series, you had the whole week off. Mm -hmm. Have you seen the Brock Lesnar-Goldberg match yet? So, People have been uh, asking me what shows, when are we going to do this show, and and, and what Well, we're show not going to. This, this is what I'm to explain to people. I took a week off so I would have more time hmm. to care for my wife. Watching four-hour pay-per-views or three-hour Monday night shows or three-hour Saturday shows would defeat the purpose of taking a week off to have more time. That's fair. That's true. I, but yes. that wasn't my question. No, I'll get to your question. I'm addressing <laughs> other people. I see. I did not watch TakeOver. I did not watch Survivor Series except Brock and Goldberg. Uh, I didn't watch Raw. I didn't watch Lucha Underground. I didn't watch any of these shows, people. I took a week off. So you watched two minutes of wrestling in the last week? Uh, well, I watched them on Sunday. Okay. And I, I, Well, I, I, did, I did watch this episode of Raw We're About to Review. I watched this, I think, Friday afternoon. Because uh, my Tuesdays are too busy to watch. Anyway, I watched Brock and Goldberg. Yes, to answer your question. All right, well, now... I did not require you to watch any wrestling during that week. Mm -hmm. I did not make one single request. No, you did not. But now that the week's over, mm -hmm. I do think, as a friend, yes. that you should go back and watch the Revival versus DIY. I've heard it was outstanding. Mm -hmm. It may have been the best tag team match all year. All right. And I think that you would love it with every ounce of your being. I see. So if you're going to go back and watch one thing mm -hmm. from the week off... Other than Goldberg and Brock Lesnar, which you watched. I think you should go back and watch that match. Fair enough. Thank you for the, the uh, recommendation. So back here in 1997, the Road Dog and Billy Gun came out. They had music now. Which was the first time, unless they debuted last week. So uh, they celebrated their win, dedicated it to the memory of the Legion of Doom. So the Road Warriors were wrestling history. Crowd was chanting for LOD. Road Dog promised to finish the Warriors off for good on Sunday at the pay-per-view. Billy says, tonight we have a non-title match against the Headbangers. At this point, the LOD showed up in street clothes and sent them packing. And Animal cut a promo saying everyone knew there was no way Road Dog and Mr. Ass could beat them fair and square. And they were not leaving the building tonight with the Warriors belts. These Legion of Doom in street clothes. I guess it could have been more appalling. 
but they just looked weird. Yeah, weird is a better word than appalling. It, it, you wouldn't think just face paint would make that much of a difference, but it's huge. Animal walked around with that haircut in real life. They both did. Yeah. Are you telling me Hawks is less embarrassing than animals? Well, he was wearing a do-rag. So. I see. Well, we don't know that in real life, animal doesn't wear Then he a would do-rag. have a big, huge rat tail hanging down the middle of his back. I can, I, I've seen recall many pictures of animal in do-rags. I mean, he still had the rat tail mohawk mullet hanging out the back. But he looked a little more respectable. <laughs> Hawks said they were going to be all over them like ugly on an ape. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for bringing that up. You're welcome. I've never heard that before. <laughs> well, now you have. Time to go to the zoo and insult some apes. Right. That's ugly all over you. Of all the ugly animals, too. They chose an ape. Dude, I'm walking today with the baby. I have to tell this story. Did you know I have a child? Did I've you know heard. I'm a father? Yeah. This has to do with animals. First off, there's a raggedy coyote mm-hmm. that's on the loose. Don't worry about around it. Around this house. A very, very small coyote. Yeah. But the baby's small. He's he's scared of, of you than you are of him. Sure. So we were... Well, first, Whitney was walking this morning, and she saw the coyote, and the coyote got chased off by two baby cows. Yeah. Yeah, they're chicken. Well, they're coyotes. Where's the chicken. cell phone video when you really need it? So today I'm walking with the baby, and the baby's sleep. I got the baby in the front pack. The baby's head is on my chest, and... She's got her little hood on because it's Seattle and it's been raining a lot. It hasn't rained all day. And I got my headphones on and I'm just listening to whatever as I'm walking down the street. Baby's got it, her head down. Seals and Croft. And sometimes I put my chin on the baby's head, you know, so it's kind of like a little uh-huh. shelf for her or whatever or for me. Anyway, I'm walking and I look down at the baby and there's a goddamn bee. The size of my thumb, uh-huh. right on top of the baby's head. So you swatted it, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, I was so goddamn scared when I saw this bee that I didn't even think for one second the baby's asleep and she's a baby. I just <laughs> whacked this bee off the top of her head. Oh, okay. Yeah, it was. I didn't slap the baby, well, but like. I just got this fucking bee out of here so fast, and her hood flies off, and she never woke up. Like, never even, she didn't do nothing. That's good ninja skills. Dude, I can't even tell you how scared I was when this bee was on top of this baby's head. What the fuck is a bee doing in, it's the end of November! Oddly enough, I had one drop on my saw just the other day at work. Like, two days ago. Oh my god. Now that's a fucking ugly animal. A bee? Bee. Getting back to the ape here. Dude, I bees was trying to figure out how the hell we got on this track. Horrifying. Horrifying. Oh, cute and fuzzy. Bullshit, Vinny. Don't give me that shit. He's just mad because they're bigger than he is. Dude, mm-hmm. if there was a bee right there on your computer, you'd jump 10 feet in the air, you'd run out of this room screaming. Can I tell you a true story? Sure. You won't believe this. That's what we're here for. I guess so. That's true. We don't lie very often. When I was a toddler, before I remember this, this is, this happened to me, but it's all secondhand as told to me by my mother. Uh, we lived in Michigan, actually on the shores of the lake. Michigan? Michigan. It's a state. It's first I knew of it. It's east of here. It wasn't long. I had to listen to your podcast to know that you lived in Kennewick. Now you also lived in Michigan? There was a time when I lived in Michigan. It was a very short time. Who is this guy? Anyway. <laughs> this isn't the weird part, by the way. <laughs> That's the weird part to me. So, Mom, when I was a toddler, we're outside playing on the shores of the lake and she gets distracted talking to a friend or something and looks around young Vinny nowhere to be seen and she starts looking around runs the length of the lake baby's not floating in the water goes up to the highway baby's not a big red smear on the road can't figure out what happened to baby Vinny and then she hears noise coming from under a boat a dilapidated boat perhaps I'm sure it was and she can hear baby giggles and stuff and she goes to look under, and she lifts up the uh, dilapidated boat, and there is young baby Vinny covered in bees. Oh, my God. Huh. Oh. <laughs> and uh, she didn't know what to do. Trying to, you know, come here, baby Vinny. Come here, baby Vinny. I like to think that's what she called me, by the way. Mm-hmm. And uh, eventually I came out, and I, I had my phone with the bees. They didn't bother me. I didn't bother them. I left. No harm, no foul. Hmm. You're lucky to be here right now. Yeah. Did you get a buzz? 
Told you I don't remember. So maybe it did. I, I thought it was funny what he just said. <laughs> it was just... I'm here concerned that you could have died, yeah. and Craig's got an alcohol joke. Well, so inappropriate. Well, I've got a bee story well, myself. I'm clearly fine. Oh, really? What's your bee story? Well, I were you out. covered in bees? No, no. Mine we were better. out installing cabinets, and one of the uh, guys that I install with went into the honey bucket to take care of business. And uh, I don't like where this is going. The other, my other coworker thought he was taking far too long. Started throwing, you know, rocks at the uh, honey bucket. About three seconds later, the door bursts open, and he is running with his pants at half mass. Apparently, there was a bee's nest up under where you take care of business, and one stung him right in the taint. I knew I didn't want to hear this story. And I made the joke, I hope the doctor can figure out which one is the stinger. Ha <laughs> ha! <laughs> you killed your story with that bad joke. Well, it's really what happened. Holy smokes. So anyway, what other insects can we talk about? Dude, I could go for hours, but let's continue they on. They don't have to run in with a millipede. I hate, I hate bugs. You got it? I understand. That's the point of the story. Yeah. If I would have woke up, I'm telling you this right now. If I would have looked down and the baby would have been surrounded by a snake, I'd have been like, all right, let's keep walking. I don't give a shit about snakes, but I fucking hate bugs. Just want to get that out there. Hmm. Everybody hates something different. Like ugly and an ape. That's where this all came from. Mm. Aguilar versus Takamichi Noku in the light heavyweight tournament semifinals. Sunny was doing ring announcing. They were not on the same page in this match, but they were doing all sorts of dives and high spots, and in a federation filled with pig farmers and headbangers, they really stood out. And Taka won with the Michinoku driver to advance to the finals. Aguilar was like a guy who was just a slightly fatter version of Hoovy. That's yeah, fair. Actually, yeah. They kind of looked the same. They were both sloppy. They were both young, and that's it. Aguila did a corkscrew moonsault from the post to the floor, and Taka sprinted at least 40 feet to catch him <laughs> to save his life. Yeah, Taka was very good. You know, I had a revelation during this match, and by revelation I mean I noticed something that I've known for 20 years now, and that is that they did some cool things, but the cruiserweights will never, ever be as exciting in WWE as they were in WCW because the ring is just too big. And so you can't have the speed that you had in WCW matches because they got to run so damn far. It's the same reason that if you're a huge fan of women's wrestling and you love All Japan women or wherever, it'll never be like that in WWE, not only because of the talent level of the women, but because the ring's so big and they take 90 steps to go from corner to corner that you never have the illusion of speed that you had in WCW and other promotions that had a smaller ring. This ring's gigantic. And that took away from this match. Any any smaller guys or women or minis. Can we talk about more bugs instead of this next segment? Oh, my God. Who brought this up? It was Semper Vivi. Randomly brought up gold dust with a ball gag. Uh -huh. And I'd forgotten. And as coincidence would have it, it's this week on the show. So this did not debut in the week I was off? There was, there's no, more to come. It did not. Jerry Lawler interviews Luna Vachon and Goldust, who is now the Speaking artist. Speaking of taint. We may have seen it. Goldust was caressing it in this segment. That's very true. Yes. Uh, he is now the artist formerly known as Goldust. He had wacky body gear, a ball gag, a neon green body condom on. Uh, and a thong over that, by the way. G-string, really. Yeah. I, okay. <laughs> so, Goldust lays on the mat fondling himself while Luna Vachon speaks. She says, Goldust is now, after living under the control of his dad and his scum-sucking wife. I do want to clarify that. Scum-sucking, she said. This is so horrifying. <laughs> Must we? Goldust is moaning and whimpering in appreciation, and I act... I actually wrote here, rubbed his ass seductively. That's mm -hmm. what you said. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. think she said Goldust would pull Vader's chain. She removed his ball gag. They tongue wrestled. All I could think was, in the middle of the Great Wrestling War, how many viewers did this lose? All of them? I lost my son. That's for sure. 
I must be getting old or something, because this was just too much for me. I couldn't believe my eyes. I was such an innocent youngster mm -hmm. that when I first saw this at 22, I didn't quite understand what I was seeing. Huh, no? I knew it hey, was all I'll messed be honest, up. I still don't understand a lot of it. I don't fully understand it, but I understand it a hell of a lot more now. Huh. Yeah. And I can't believe I saw it on television. Oh, it gets worse. Remember Baby New Year? And a honey bucket? No. Oh, yeah, it's coming up, dude. Yeah. Like, who thought this was a good idea? See, that's my that's my question. Who, when they went over I this mean, format, I have a pretty good idea. Yeah. But like I say... I bet this lost in the ratings war. Call that a hunch. I hope. Jerry Lawler defeated Tito Santana in the Karate Fighters Tournament. Yeah. Jerry Lawler beat Tito Santana. They had Burger King and Taco Time jokes. Uh, yeah. Taco Bell. Taco this Bell? would have been better as the actual wrestling match. Taco, Taco Bell or Taco Time? Taco, Taco Time is a regional thing. Yeah. I don't care. I'm just telling. So Steak and Shake. We don't have them around here. Well, we don't. He is right this time. Thank you. Actually, I th what's the one? One just hey, we opened have a Chick Fil A. That's we, right. We I think it's a Steak and Shake. There's one famous burger chain that has one location in the middle of downtown Seattle. I think it's Steak and Shake. When you get off the freeway at Kenyon Park, the old Denny's. Okay. Chick Fil A. We've no got. Way. Yep. It's coming. That's, oh, coming. Okay. Yep. They're building one in Puyallup as well. Yeah, there's there are a few here now. Vinny and I don't care about Puyallup. Just saying. It is a steak. There's one steak and shake in downtown Seattle. Hmm. There you go. Thank God we settled that. Uh, Chains versus D'Lo Brown versus Miguel Perez versus Recon in what the announcers openly promised on multiple occasions would be a train wreck. You know, this match as a tag team match would have been bad. This is a four-way match would have been bad, but they decided to make this elimination rules yeah. to drag it out. You know, it's funny. I was so not paying attention. As soon as whoever came out first came out, I just gave up. And I thought it was a tag team match. And they're doing this match, and Recon got pinned. And I was like, thank God. And then it kept going. Mm -hmm. And I realized, oh my God, it's a four-way elimination match. And then it went on and on and on. And after wasting all of this time, a bunch of geeks ran in for the DQ. They couldn't even give us a finish. <laughs> in this four way. I was so fucking appalled. And then the Jackal is outside doing commentary. The best thing in the crew, by the way. I mean, he's clearly the most talented individual of all of the geeks out there. Mm-hmm. And he's doing commentary. And I was getting really mad about it. But oh, there then, was The Rock. I guess he's in the All right, Nation fair. of Domination. That, but was he down there at ringside? Did they actually trot uh, his ass out there? I don't they, think they did. Yes, because did they? they were wow. chanting Rocky sucks and also doing the tomahawk chop to mock him. Okay, well, listen. The Rock ended up significantly more... What would be the word? Well-rounded than fair. the Jackal. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure he was at this exact moment. Fair enough. But the point is... Whether he was the best or the second best, I was getting really mad that he was at ringside and these other idiots were in the ring. And then the announcers said during this giant brawl, Jackal, why aren't you getting involved with this? And the Jackal's response was, I'm not an idiot. And it suddenly hit me, hmm. I don't want him involved in this. <laughs> yes. Just stay outside doing commentary because you're not going to make it better. No one can. No. The Rock couldn't make it better. He did not. DX came out for a promo. It's Hunter, Sean, and China. They all come out on a stage, and Sean's in a wheelchair. This was the best. <laughs> Just news. This to was the, the best. Craig, yeah. nothing's ever been better than this. This was good. I like it. Good. <laughs> so they were trying to think of the best word to describe Jim Neidhart. He was not an idiot, he wasn't a Nimrod. They had played him like a sucker, and they pulled the suckers out of their mouths and held them up to emphasize their joke. That's how proud of it they were. This was not the best part of this early speech. I laughed. The best part oh. was when Sean called Triple H, try. Mm -hmm. And the level of disgust in Jim Ross's voice. <laughs> yes. Try. 
He was so sickened, I thought he was going to quit the business. <laughs> it was so awesome. Disgusted Jim Ross is the best character in wrestling. Oh, sure. No doubt about that. Hunter said he was not afraid of any match with Sergeant Slaughter, promised to use all his heavy artillery, except, of course, the big bazooka, which we saved for Mrs. Slaughter. So Sean explains why he's in a wheelchair. Well, thank God he's not going to hit him with his dick. <laughs> I'm glad that's cleared up. Sean says he is in a wheelchair because China has been putting him through vigorous leg workouts in preparation for facing Ken Shamrock. To counter Ken's ankle submission hold is what Sean said, which sounds less than Granny would say. Mm. He had developed an all-time high pain tolerance. The pills. <laughs> he wanted Hunter to help him display his all-time high pain tolerance. Hunter says, are you sure? Sean says, yeah, I can take it. So, Sean, so Hunter takes his left leg, he raises it, and he takes the foot and starts putting pressure on it to twist it. And Sean grimaces and says, okay, I'm okay, go a little farther. Hunter twists it a little more. Sean says, I'm good, I'm good, go a little farther. And Hunter twists it about 90 degrees. Sean says, keep going. And they twist the leg. It's doing three or four revolutions. He starts bending it left and right and up and down at the knee. And Sean just grimaces his way through the whole thing, but guts it out because he's that tough. Classic dumb heel comedy. I loved every, every moment of this. Everybody was so awesome. And the best part was, when it was over, they didn't take off the fake leg mm -hmm. and swing it around no. and expose the joke. No. no. They literally ended the segment pretending that that was really his leg. Right. Just the opposite. They stuck with it till the bitter end. Just the opposite. They perched it straight up in the air. And so Sean it, bit it. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so he was biting his own toe. <laughs> God, it was so great. This was my favorite thing on either show all night. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. They showed the finish in Montreal, zooming in on Earl Hebner asking Brett twice if he wanted to submit, then calling for the bell. They pointed out Sean did not react like a guy who had just tapped out his rival with his own hole to win a championship, and they promised more footage later. <laughs> so as noted I missed a show last week but I did check on the board to see what uh, came up on the show that I missed apparently there's a great discussion about beepers <laughs> oh yeah right. now was this did you guys have like a one minute conversation that spawned a 20 comment thread on the board now it was about five minutes okay we we're trying to figure out how I they worked. worked I see no I remember this this I thought this was an all time great angle you know what the problem with this was the music they edited in i don't even know what it may have been the sandman's ripoff music it was so distracting well i went back and watched on youtube and what i found on the original broadcast was stone cold in his vehicle driving up and acdc's back in black is playing okay, which I is see. not you're talking about the truck angle. Yes. No, I'm talking about last week with the beeper. Oh, no, no, no. That was great. Beeper was great. Yeah, that was yeah. an awesome angle. This right here, they did this angle. You can recap it. The, the, okay, yes, you were right. The key to this is they had to edit in some stupid music. Yes. And the match is The Rock. Think about this. It's The Rock versus Big Van Vader. Mm -hmm. I was so goddamn excited to see yeah. this match. Mm -hmm. I could not pay attention to a moment of it no. because of this goddamn distracting music in yeah. the background. Yes. It was the worst edit job. It was horrible. Ever done. Yeah, it was very, very irritating. Yeah, this went on for a while. Vader out there. <laughs> so Austin's out there to distract the rock or fuck with him or whatever. Meanwhile, poor Vader has to wrestle the Rock and the Nation of Domination. He's fighting three on one, and Austin's not laying a finger, raising a finger to help. Goldust runs out. Now it's five on one. Austin's still not helping. At last, Vader chases Goldust to the back for the DQ, and the Nation yells at Austin, and he yells back. And on paper, this sounds like the, the worst segment ever. And granted, the piped-in music did not help, but at the end of the day, it was Steve Austin and the Rock, and it was just about unfuck upable. You're for, you're glossing over the most noteworthy part of all of this, and that is that if you look at this through modern eyes, what happened at the end was 
The Rock, The Rock, laid out Vader and hit him with the people's elbow. And Vader just threw him high into the air, kicked out, and walked out of the ring. Mm -hmm. I couldn't even believe my eyes. This would be like, I can't even think of a good modern example. But some devastating finishing move. And the guy just kicks out and walks away. Like it was nothing. Because back then, it was nothing. It was. The people's elbow was nothing. Later, it became a devastating finisher. Except at WrestleMania. Nothing will top a week or two ago when uh, it was not a live show. And he began the people's elbow. They went to commercial and they came back and he was still doing it. That's right. That that's, was, that's a long people's that's elbow. That's the all-time best. Ken Shamrock video. I love this. Ken Shamrock had a job at this point in WWF because he was a professional fighter. He was trained, he was disciplined, he was skilled, he was knowledgeable. But in WWF, to make him a dangerous man, he snaps. <laughs> you can't have a guy who's a skilled fighter and that's why he's dangerous. No, no, no. He must lose control. Because I can't tell you how many times I've seen somebody win the octagon because they snapped. Well, you know, he's an athlete. So he's going to be a competitor. But imagine if he snapped. It's like Mike Tyson. Well, he did snap. He snapped that's, and he bit people's ears that's off. A bad he was even more dangerous. Yeah, I think he's got a point there. Scott Taylor was supposed to wrestle Brian Christopher, but Kane came out instead. He no sold a bunch of Scott Taylor's drop kicks. Dude, the sweetest looking drop kicks and the lightest drop kicks of all time. Yeah. I'd have a match with Scotty Two Adi today. Oh, hell yeah. In a heartbeat. It would be all comedy. He'd have the worm and win. Why wouldn't you do this? I'd let him worm me. Yes, I bet you would. So. Twice on Sunday. <laughs> so, Paul Bear promised to make Undertaker's life a living hell. It seemed more like he was making Scott Taylor's life a living hell. And then after all this, they announced Brian Christopher had advanced to the finals via forfeit. That's funny. Paul Levesque is like the one Paul who wasn't way better back then. Paul Bearer okay. was so much more awesome than I remember. I see. And Paul Jones was like the greatest. That's true. He was truly number one. Paul White? Paul White was, was so way awesome better back then. Yeah. Paul Levesque was way worse back then. Yeah. I don't know what any of this means, but... There's more guys named Paul in this business than I realized. Paul Orndorff? He was awesome. We haven't seen him in years. <laughs> Paul Roma? Remember when Paul Orndorff came back with that music? Way more awesome now than it was in the time. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Ahmed Johnson versus Jeff Jarrett. Now, I wonder if that's where they got glorious. I was thinking the exact same thing. It's very possible. Before we get into this match, Ahmed Johnson, as we have seen through the years in the show, a one-man wrecking crew. Mm -hmm. A hazard to himself and others at all times. Here's breaking news, everyone. Earlier in the week, Ahmed Johnson had rolled his car and nearly died. Yeah. This guy, by himself, is the Spinal Tap drummer. <laughs> Just dies every week. It went over Brian. He's still head. around. He so, doesn't work anymore, though. I don't think so. I should hope not. So Jeff Jarrett comes out, refuses to wrestle. He makes it clear, I left because of you in the first place. Mm. Yes. He was upset with Jim Ross for failing to promote his match. His dressing room was not up to snuff. Called Ahmed a water-retaining idiot. Said everyone knew he was not on Jeff's level. Ahmed called him a chicken shit. Jeff was appalled. Sergeant Slaughter came out. He admitted that con contractually he cannot force Jarrett to wrestle tonight. But he could on Sunday and booked him against The Undertaker. And Jarrett was upset. I don't remember, but I can only presume that Kane cost Undertaker that match. You would think. Had a Slaughter at Helmsley video package. This was great. Shows what a great build for a horrible match. Slaughter tapping out tons of dudes through the years with a Cobra Clutch. And the whole point of this was, they, they didn't lie to you. Listen, Sarge has seen better days. That's he, for sure. He's older and fatter now than he used to be. But he still has this one deadly hold. And if he can grab a 2 by 4 chair and get an advantage on Hunter and lock in this hold, then Hunter's fucked. Man, if you like this, you should have watched last week when he cut an old-school Sergeant Slaughter promo and threatened to kill, kill, mm -hmm. 
Hunter Hearst Helmsley. Straight out of the G.I. Joe cartoon. He threatened that when the show was over, Paul Levesque would be dead as a result of this match. Hmm. Headbangers versus Road Dog and Billy Gunn. Waste of my time. It went three minutes. They did a hot tag. The LOD attacked. The Outlaws grabbed the belt and ran to the back, got in their car and drove away again. And now the Headbangers and LOD are mad at each other. We kept the angle last week when DX brought out a mini Brett, dressed as Bret Hart and uh, ran that Hart down, teased and invited him into the group, then turned on him, nutshotted him, and laid him out. Jim Cornette brought out Mark Merrow and Sable for a promo. Allow me for a moment here. <laughs> we make fun of all of these horrible backstage interview geeks asking their stupid questions. And I will give Jim Cornette credit that his delivery was much better than Dasha's. Let me write that down. But with that said, let me tell you what he asked Mark Merrill. He said, Mark, fans could not care less if you were dead. But they love your wife. How do you react to that? That was his question. Yeah. Pretty much, yes. What a horrible journalist. <laughs> Mark actually asked Sable, and I quote, Who have you ever beaten? Yes. That was awesome. Well, mm -hmm. after he asked her if she'd ever done any marrow salt. I like when he said, I am rewriting the physics books based on my high flying. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you're not Agula. He said Sable was nothing when he found her and would be nothing when he kicked her to the curb. Promised to teach Butterbean a lesson at the pay-per-view. So Sable held up hand mitts with Butterbean's face on them. And Mara was throwing combos when a mitt went flying. He yelled at Sable to go pick it up and said she was trying to make him look bad. He said while he had been on the shelf, she had been modeling t-shirts for other wrestlers. She should have been modeling marvelous Mark Merrill wear. <laughs> and Jerry Lawler just says, that wouldn't sell. He's not wrong. It would not. So she was crying, and Mero ordered her to the back and promised one more time to beat up Butterbean, and that was that. He had more from Montreal. After the bell, they showed Vince immediately jumping out of his seat to say something to Sean, Brett spitting in Vince's face. And a close-up of Brett's face at the exact moment the ref called for the bell. And of course, none of this proved anything. Sean was a great liar. That's what this proved. Well, that's true. Triple H versus Jim Neidhart. All right, Vinny, you were not here last week. No. And so you missed Sean Michaels versus Vader. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go on a limb. It, it was, was better than this. And Craig and I talked about this for a long time. But what happened was it was a four-minute match. Right. Sean Michaels sold for three minutes and 59 seconds. True. Until they did the finish, and he super kicked him and pinned him. And I said, can you imagine in his whole career, Triple H ever doing this for anybody ever? It would never happen. I ranted about this for like five minutes. Well, fuck me. Mm -hmm. If the very next week, Hunter did not have a five-minute match with Jim Neidhart, where he sold for four minutes and 59 seconds. Now, as you recap this match... Went 2.30, by the way. Whatever. This is what you need to keep in mind. Jim... Neidhart was leaving this company. Yeah. To go to the other organization. Tell us what they did with Jim Neidhart on his last night in. Uh, Jim clobbered him in a very boring manner is what I wrote. I believe he took the entire match until the end. China took the rough, took the ref, <laughs> roughly, and Hunter had a chair shot and won. Jim Neidhart beat up Triple H the entire match. And then they had to cheat to beat him. Yeah. On his way out. Yes. What the fuck is going on? It was a strange time. <laughs> it was a strange time. So they planted him with a pedigree in the chair. And Sean painted WCW on his back to make it abundantly clear what was going on here. And <laughs> this is not, a, not quite as big a deal as your memory that Henry Godwin broke his neck and was never seen again. But I had, my memory was they humiliated uh, Jim Neidhart, painted WCW on his back, and that was the end. No! There's more. They beat him up more, 
handcuffed him to the rope. At this point, Sarge ran down to brawl with Hunter, and Shamrock ran down to brawl with Sean, and Neidhart, though he had been uh, handcuffed to the rope, used his free arm to hold back China from making the save. He was still helping. And so Sean was tapping out to the ankle submission hold, and Hunter was tapping to the Cobra Clutch, and that is how the show went off the air. That was a very good finish. I mean, I don't remember for sure. Maybe he had another show or two that he was around. I'm almost positive not. Where they could just beat him clean in the middle because he was on his way out. But if this was his last show, <laughs> I just could not believe it. It's like Vince said, dude's leaving, but make sure that, make sure he stands tall here at the end of this match. And Hunter don't give him one move until the end. Hunter didn't even pedigree the guy in the match. No. He did afterwards. No. Onto a chair, but then he was still fighting afterwards. This was amazing. 